Welcome to Hot Chips 23. Tutorial 2 The Open Compute Project. This is the Facebook Open Compute Initiative, and our first speaker is Amir Michael. Um, a lot of people have their heads in the cloud, and um, Amir joined Facebook in 2009 to actually build one. And he's responsible for the hardware design team uh, for, the, for the, uh, the power is one of the most trafficked websites on the planet, really. And he was part of the small team at Facebook that um, started to build one of the most compute, uh, efficient computing infrastructures at the lowest possible cost. Um, and the result of that was a, a dedicated uh, data center, which was far more efficient uh, than anything else that had been built in the past. And he plays an active role in the Open Compute Initiative as well. And he's here to talk about it. Come here. Thanks. So if we can get the slides up on the big screen. There you go. A couple um, housekeeping items beforehand. Uh, the slides are fresh, so they're not yet on the USB drives. We do have the printouts. Uh, we'll have the latest versions of the slides on the website um, after the tutorial. Uh, another thing, feel free to ask questions uh, during the presentation. Uh, I'll also have some time at the end for questions as well. And uh, it's a little bit hard for me to see, so if you have a question, wave your hand so I can see the motion. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, my name's Amir Michael. Um, I'm the manager of system engineering at Facebook. Uh, today we'll uh, go over our Open Compute project, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, the motivation behind it, how we ended up where we did, why we did um, particular things. And then we'll have breakouts uh, into different aspects of the Open Compute projects, what we were thinking uh, when we designed the different parts of this particular server that we use at Facebook. Um, so let's, let's get going. Uh, this should look familiar to some of you. This is uh, what a typical data center looks like. Uh, Facebook is a site, uh, uh, as Alan mentioned, is one of the most traffic sites um, today on the internet. That requires massive, massive amounts of infrastructure. Um, all this infrastructure basically boils down to uh, thousands and thousands of processors, right? So if you have a processor to do your basic compute, you need to wrap that in some, some sort of a package uh, to provide power and to cool it, and that's typically called a server. Uh, and we have thousands and thousands of servers. Now when you have so many servers, storing them becomes a problem, and you put them in uh, in big warehouses, more or less, because that's what you put large uh, volumes of, of objects in. You put them in warehouses. And when you do that, uh, you run into some challenges. You need to provide cooling for them, because ultimately, these are big heaters in the space. You also need to supply uh, power to them as well. Um, and so these things are typically called data centers. Um, not, not all of them are based around data. A lot of them are based around compute and, and quick uh, access to, to caches. And there's networks that go in there. But the common term in the industry is a data center. Uh, and this is more or less what we had in the early days of Facebook. We started buying servers individually. And then we started buying them by the rack. And once you start doing that, you need a, a more organized place or a data center to put them in. So we started leasing co-locations in data centers. Uh, and these co-locations um, are basically uh, large data centers, and they'll fence off an area for you. And it's literally like a cage. You put your racks inside of this cage. They supply power and network for you. Uh, you pay them a monthly bill based on how much power you consume. And then you have a nice, secure place to keep your servers. Uh, eventually, when you get to the point 
uh, where you have so much infrastructure, you start leasing the entire building. And we got to that point at Facebook where we were uh, leasing entire projects that many of the common data center uh, providers um, were working on. So Digital Real Realty Trust had a new data center opening uh, and they were looking for customers to fill into it, much like a, a landlord looks for tenants for his apartment complex. Uh, and we went to DRT and we said, this is a great building, we'll take the whole thing. Uh, and we put all of our servers in there. We started looking at the costs of doing business like this and the scale of the site and how quickly we were ramping up uh, with the hundreds of millions of users that were accessing the sites, the billions of photos they were uploading. Uh, the cost actually started to accumulate rather quickly. And this typical model of deployment of standard servers that you buy from, from the industry, from the Dells, the HPs, the IBMs, inside of traditional co-locations wasn't scaling very well either. And we had a number of projects to try and optimize these data centers. Uh, I'll go through a couple of the things uh, uh, that we looked at when we're trying to see, see how we could optimize a, a typical type of server and a typical type of data center. It really boiled down to the TCO or the total cost of ownership. And that comes out in a couple ways for Facebook. Uh, we look at the acquisition cost. So how much does the server and data center space actually cost per server? We have very good metrics, metrics around this. And we know per server how much we're paying in rent, how much we're paying in power, uh, both to supply power to the server and to cool it. Uh, we look at the, uh, and the way you can change these things are, are through the design, right? If you change the design of the data center or the design of the server, you can make adjustments to your cost. You can also play with the features. Uh, you can remove cost by taking away redundancy or uh, reducing the availability of the building or of the server itself. We also looked at the operational cost as well. And that comes into power mainly. Power goes for a couple different things. One is to go into the actual processor. All the losses that you get from uh, the transformer from the utility down to the processor, there's a whole num number of things that we looked at in that process. You also need power to, con uh, to cool the servers. How do you remove megawatts of heat from a building, right? If you, uh, and this has happened before, if your cooling system goes offline, the building gets very hot very quickly uh, to the point where hopefully a sensor will pick that up and shut off power to the servers. And also service or maintainability. How much does it cost for us to keep these servers online? When you have your laptop or your desktop at home, it may fail once every three years. A drive can go bad. A processor not, not often happens, but it does go bad. Uh, memory goes bad. You get uh, bit errors. Um, when you have tens of thousands of servers, things fail often. We have hardware failing every minute, and we have a team of people dedicated to just repairing this hardware in our data centers. And they have a long queue of broken servers, and they go and they diagnose, and they repair the servers, and they swap components in and out. That team costs money, it's, it's manpower. How do we make their job easier and more efficient as well? And one of the other things we look at is performance as well. How much work do we get from the actual hardware? And we have many, many different applications. Uh, and one metric that we use is the number of user pages we can serve per second out of a server. And that's uh, one of the key metrics we use when we judge performance. So this is what a typical power distribution scheme looks like in the data center. Uh, you can buy power straight from the utility, uh, and that's usually given to you, uh, not on this slide, but at 13 and a half kilovolts, very high voltage. If you're a data center operator, you'll have your own on-site transformers, and you'll step that down to 480 volts. Um, you'll take the 480 volts, and these transformers can be sprinkled around the perimeter of the building, and you're distributed into the building. Now, if a data center were to lose power, if there was a blackout, and they do happen, in the valley here we have pretty reliable power, um, but you do get blackouts every so often. So we build these things called UPSs, or uninterruptible power supplies. They'll take the AC power, do an AC to DC conversion, charge a series of lead-acid batteries. That conversion usually costs a couple percentage points in efficiencies. Then we take the DC, convert it back to AC. Again, we lose a couple more percentage points of efficiency. And then we distribute that out through the building to these devices called PDUs, or automatic transfer switches. Um, and what those will do, uh, they'll have transformers inside of them, and they'll take the 480 volts and step it down to 208 volts phase-to-phase, uh, -phase, or 120 volts like you get out of your outlet at home if you go phase-to-neutral. Um, that transformation also has an efficiency hit as well. Finally, after that, you'll take your power, 
uh, you'll put it down a power strip, which is in the rack containing many servers, and you'll take that 208 volts and you'll power, plug it into the power supplies of the server. So you can get anywhere between 11 and 17% loss in that system. We looked at the cooling as well. A typical data center uh, has a raised floor, so the servers are actually sitting above the concrete slab of the building. Uh, and you'll have these devices called computer room air handlers, uh, which is the blue box on your left. Um, and that'll take chilled water from some sort of cooling mechanism, which usually sits outside of the building. Uh, these cooling mechanisms aren't that different from the same air conditioning units you might find in your local shopping mall. Uh, they'll pump that cold water into the building. Uh, it'll go to the air handler, and then it'll go through a radiator or a coil, which will have a fan that'll suck air through that coil and then pressurize the underfloor area of the data center. We'll place racks in the data center strategically, and then we'll take out the tiles or sections of the floor and replace them with perforated tiles so that the cold air can come up from the bottom of the floor in through the servers, cool off the servers, and then back into the air handler. And the whole process repeats itself. Now, we did a little study when we looked at acquisition cost. Uh, when we looked at the actual uh, uh, server itself, uh, we were buying servers from Dell, HP, um, those types of vendors at the time. And I actually thought it was interesting to see uh, if I could apply some of the same uh, type of uh, thinking I had when I built my desktop at home to this server. I've always built my own computers at home because I get a better deal. I can get a faster processor, a better motherboard, more memory if I buy the components and assemble it myself. I never actually went and bought a, a pre-made desktop from anyone. Um, and I priced out our server that we were purchasing from Dell at the time. Uh, and I compared it to the prices on this other website called Newegg, which is one of the largest distributors of computer hardware. And I was actually surprised by what I found. For the exact same components, I found that I actually had a cheaper price at retail in single unit volumes from Newegg. Now, of course, it's not a fair comparison, mainly because Dell provides a lot more services like warranty support, um, on-site support when we have failures. Uh, there's a lot of sales support. Uh, we can actually finance the servers through Dell as well. So they do add a little bit more value, things that Newegg can't quite do. But that actually piqued our curiosity at the time. And we started thinking about alternate methods or alternate business models for acquiring massive amounts of hardware like this. Then we also looked at the design of the server. This is a typical 2U server. Um, something like this might retail for $3,000, $5,000, and it needs to look like that, right? If you're gonna spend a lot of money on a car, it needs to look nice. If you're gonna spend a lot of money on a server, it needs to look nice. So they put plastic bezels on these, they paint them, they put LEDs. There's all kinds of features and options and, and interesting displays on here. Um, and those types of things, uh, make the server uh, uh, look like it should cost what it, what it is, but the reality is they don't add any, any function to the server. And so that was another area which, which we were questioning, is why do servers actually look the way they do? We also looked at the power transformation scheme. We looked at the UPS. That was the biggest loss leader as far as efficiency goes. How can we get rid of that system? We looked at, at the transformers. Right. A lot of the transformers were there because of standards that were in the industry. 208, 120 volt power is an industry standard, so it was 480. Why do we need those? Uh, can, we, can we change that and make something more efficient, which might not necessarily be a standard, though? We looked at voltage regulators on the motherboard themselves and inside of the power supplies themselves. The industry had become accustomed to uh, um, selling servers in high volume, taking uh, as much uh, profit as they could uh, from these servers, but as a result, uh, they weren't really advocating the end user. As an end user, we pay the electricity bill in our data centers, but Dell and HP don't pay the bill. So it's okay if they use a slightly cheaper FET or a slightly less efficient regulator um, because it saved them money, but also it made them more competitive, but, uh, and most end users didn't really pay attention to that. But when you buy at the scale that we do, you start to pay attention to those things. And we also looked at unnecessary components as well. There are many features on the servers themselves or in the data center that didn't add any value to us. All of those components take power, uh, can take several watts of power at times. Why do we need them? We also looked at the height of the server. The industry has standards around height. Uh, they're uh, talked about in use or rack units, 
1.75 inches is a rack unit. I don't know where that number came from, probably from the old days of the telcos, but that's what everyone builds to today. Is that the, rack, the right size for a server? Do you want a short uh, server or a tall server? We didn't really know what the answer was. We also looked at serviceability. This is the insides of a typical 1U server. You can see there's a lot of cables in the way. Uh, a lot of screws actually hold the server together. When a technician needs to replace a motherboard, they need to remove at least 15 screws. It takes them a lot of time. Um, a lot of features are in this for mechanical rigidity, uh, and they actually prevent a lot of airflow uh, through the server. It makes it less thermally efficient. Why do we need all these features in the server? Can we make a better design than this? Going back to the height, we looked at fans, right? I talked a little bit about thermal efficiency. A lot of the servers we bought uh, had 40 millimeter fans in there that drew power, uh, that drew uh, uh, air through the server, consumed quite a bit of power. They actually sounded like hair dryers when you turned them on. I'm sure some of you have experienced that. Um, seemed like a lot of energy was going into the fans. Is there a more efficient type of fan that we can use? Uh, we looked at a 1U fan, a 40 millimeter fan, we looked at a larger fan, a 2U fan, and we found that larger fans inherently are more efficient. That was a no-brainer. You spend less energy to move uh, the same volume of, it, of air as you would with a 1U fan. And we actually did some analysis and discovered that a 1.5U fan, a 60 millimeter fan, actually has a lot of benefits. It's a lot more efficient than a 1U fan, but it doesn't quite uh, make the servers, uh, the density of the servers more manageable. If you, all your servers were using large fans, you would have uh, less density in your servers and you'd have to build a larger data center to accommodate all of them. One and a half U for us, when we took into account the data center cost, con uh, construction cost, was actually the sweet spot. So what did we do? We went ahead and we went to our shipping and receiving dock and we kicked out that department and we built a lab in there. Uh, and this was a, a small portion of our uh, electrical design lab uh, in our campus on uh, California Ave, just about a mile and a half from here. And we started doing a lot of research and analysis and thinking about the system itself, figuring out if we can do, uh, uh, challenge some of these designs, come up with a better type of system. And then we discovered that we could do a bunch of things to the server, make it more efficient. We could also do a couple things to the data center and make it more efficient, but it wasn't really going to give us the, uh, the, the type of performance or efficiency improvements that we were looking for. We wanted something big. We wanted double-digit gains in cost and efficiency. And we discovered that if you change both the data center and the server to work together, you can now get those double-digit gains in efficiency rather than just trying to change one of them. So I'll talk a little bit about the, things, the changes that we made on the data center. So you're familiar with the typical power draw on your left. On the right, this is the power scheme in our new Prineville data center that's up in Oregon right now. Uh, we take medium voltage from the utility, and that's really where the metering starts. So we pay for power at the 13 and a half kilovolts. Uh, we, sp we have our site transformers sprinkled around the building that are converting from uh, 13 and a half uh, kilovolts down to 480 volts. So that portion is the same. What we did then is we took this power and we distributed it throughout the building directly to the servers. And we actually supply 277 volts straight to the server. Uh, now, most power supplies in the industry will take power anywhere from 90 volts down to 204, or all the way up to 240 volts. That created a problem for us. At this point, we needed a custom power supply. Um, so we went down that path, and Pierre Luigi is going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but that actually allowed us to cut out a lot of the transformation in between. From that power supply, we still needed to solve the UPS problem. When we get a blackout, we need the servers to stay online for around 10, 10 seconds until the diesel generators outside the buildings fire up and start supplying AC power back to the servers. Uh, and so we wanted something to hold them up for that short time frame. And what we did is we created a clever design in our power supply that actually takes a second input and switches between the two uh, and it takes power from a battery cabinet, lead-acid batteries that we deploy throughout the data center, and they'll hold up or sustain power to the servers in the event of a power outage just for a very brief period of time until the generators kick in. If you compare the two systems, um, 11 to 17% loss, depending on the systems for a typical data center, our, typical, our system has a 2% loss. So we already saw some double-digit gains on power efficiency. 
This is more or less what our cooling system looks like in the data center. And I'll walk you through the life of an air molecule going through our particular facility. On the bottom, you see the servers. That's the first floor of the building. On top of that, we have our penthouse, or our mezzanine. And that's what contains all of our cooling systems, or lack thereof, because there really isn't much to it. So rather than spending a lot of money on air conditioning systems, we actually built the data center in an area that has a favorable climate for using outside air. Uh, rather than uh, uh, using electrical mechanical devices to cool water, we opened up the doors to the building and we actually take fresh air in from the outside and pump it straight into the building. And the arrow is pointing to the inlets on top of the building where that actually happens. On the left is the other side of those inlets. Uh, air comes in from there. And it goes into what we call this mixing room. The cold air comes in from the top. And now, during the winter in Prineville, it can be very cold. It can be below freezing over there. If we were to take that cold air straight into the data center floor, we might lose some technicians because they would freeze. So rather than doing that, uh, we take some of the hot return air from the servers, and we mix it in with the cold air. And we try and maintain the 60 degree temperature, 60 degrees Fahrenheit temperature for that air. Um, the air mixes in this room and then it flows to the right through a series of filters that remove any uh, particles from the air. We then had uh, a system that is uh, not unlike some of the misting systems that you'll see at amusement parks uh, that are used to keep some of the, uh, the customers cool while they're waiting in line to get on the roller coaster. We uh, atomize water um, and it, uh, by doing so it drops the temperature of the air and adds humidity. Uh, so the climate in Prineville is actually cold and dry. During the summer, it can get warm. And so during those hotter days, we add some humidity to the air and we, we drop the temperature of the air. Uh, that uh, moist, humid air flows through mist eliminators, which are more or less um, um, uh, fibrous fabric, which removes a lot of the water droplets from the air. So we're not actually passing uh, water in a liquid form through this mist eliminator. And after the mist, it goes through the mist eliminator on the left, it goes through a series of fans on the right. Uh, and those fans are really the only mechanical apparatus that, take, uh, a, a, uh, that consume power in our entire cooling system. Uh, they're very efficient fans, uh, and we set them up in, in lines or in walls, in fan walls. Uh, each fan wall has 20 fans in them, and they're uh, so, uh, controlled by uh, VFDs or variable frequency drives, so we can adjust the speed of the fans up and down depending on the load in the data center. After the fans, uh, the air comes down and goes down a supply shaft, and that shaft ends up on the data center floor, which is what you see in this slide over here. The air goes down the center aisle of the data center floor and then spreads across the rows of servers inside. Uh, the servers will have their own fans as well. Those are really used for localized cooling. So the pressure generated by the larger fans on the, on the second floor is enough to do most of the cooling during idle for the servers. Uh, and if you go through a row of servers, the reality is uh, most of the servers aren't, are barely using their, their um, their smaller fans on the server themselves. They're just there to add supplemental cooling during high load conditions. Actually, if you walk down one of these aisles, if you go to the contained hot aisle of one of these rows, it's actually very quiet and warm. It's a great place for a nap. Um, afterwards, we contain the hot air and we bring it back up through another duct. And then we have a series of auxiliary fans that we installed that can potentially add more um, uh, movement to the air and help the air exit through the building. This is what those fans look like. And the air from here escapes back out the other side of the building, uh, warmer than it was when it entered. Uh, we don't actually use these fans today. We added them as a just-in-case scenario, since this was, this was the first time we built this type of a facility. Yes, question. I was just going to ask you about um, the power for the water, or the water uh -huh. reuse, because you have to pump water out of the misters, and mm -hmm. then do you recycle it, and so is there some energy to pump? Yep, uh, so I didn't go into these details. We actually have a reverse osmosis system, and uh, after it goes through the mist eliminator, we do get some uh, water dripping to the bottom. Uh, we collect that, and we put it through our reverse osmosis system, uh, and then we recycle that water. The pumps themselves don't take any appreciable amount of power. Um, there's a high pressure in the, in the, uh, the nozzles themselves, uh, but the, the amount of, of power going into the pumps was relatively small 
compare it to the rest of the load, uh, if you compare it definitely to the server load, and also compare it to the load of the fans themselves. Do you run thermal simulation before you build whole things? Yep. Do, do we run a thermal simulation? Sure. Um, we, are, uh, we have a number of different software packages that we use, future facilities, flow therm. Uh, we created models for the entire building before we actually um, uh, finalized on the, on the cooling. Uh, we found that uh, the models were good. Uh, it gave us confidence that the design would actually work, that there would be a solution. We didn't know what the exact solution was. And we really only found that uh, getting it uh, uh, to operate most efficiently could only be done once we actually had the building in place, had load in the building, and then we went ahead and started tweaking and tuning uh, the algorithms for controlling the fans, for the water, and all of those things. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, two questions. One is, uh, the, how much is the cost of the water and then second is, uh, is there any danger that the humidity uh, cause the bad effect to the board or chips? Mm -hmm. Sure, uh, cost of water. Um, I'm not sure that I have an answer for that. Uh, I can tell you a little bit about how we uh, obtain our water. We actually have a well on site that we'll uh, draw water from. In addition to that, in the event that we have problems with the well, we have a connection to the municipality's water supply as well. Um, I'm not sure what that actually cost us, though. It's a good question. And then the second one was about, um, uh, there's a, was there another part to your question? Humidity. Humidity, right. Uh, so we actually looked at, um, so we looked at, before I actually get to the answer, we looked at the 50-year weather bin data for this particular site. And we did an analysis to understand uh, what the worst case operating conditions would be uh, had we built in this particular site. Uh, and it turns out that at this site, we're confident we can keep the humidity below 90 degrees uh, or 90 percent humidity, relative humidity, and the temperature below um, 84.7 degrees. Uh, sorry, this site is 81.4 degrees uh, Fahrenheit throughout the entire year. Uh, if you go to other geographies, you may have to play with those different variables to see. As far as humidity goes on the board, we're not concerned too much about overall relative humidity uh, unless it starts to condense. And condensing humidity uh, really depends on how quickly you change the temperature and the humidity within the building. Uh, and so you want to make sure that you have very good control over how quickly you make those changes so that you don't get any condensation on the server itself. Aside from condensation, we feel confident that um, running at, at uh, higher humidity levels isn't really a problem for the servers. Oh, sorry, went ahead one. Okay, so to the server now. Um, this is what we ended up with our final server design. Um, you can see a lot of, uh, I'll go over the individual components. This is a high level of how everything fits in. The motherboard sits at the bottom left. The power supply is directly above that. We have room for up to six drive cages. In this particular uh, image, there's only a single drive cage over here. Each cage can hold two drives. Uh, so, I'm sorry, you can hold three drive cages, six drives total. In the back, we, we put the fans over there. Uh, putting the fans in the back was interesting because it solved a lot of recirculation problems that you typically have in a 1U server, which has the fans in the middle. This is our chassis. I like to call this our beautiful chassis. Um, other people who say it's ugly, I ask them to call it vanity free. Um, it's really bare bones. We didn't actually um, put any features in here that didn't add any value or functionality for the server. Uh, and so it's uh, made out of a 1.2 millimeter pre-plated sheet metal. I think there's only six parts in total, six pieces of metal that are riveted together to compose the chassis. Uh, serviceability was important on this. Uh, and uh, Part of not having a lid on the chassis actually improves serviceability quite a bit. Uh, the motherboards um, are easy to access in the front. Typically, motherboards sit somewhere towards the back of the server. The drives are in the front. Everyone's afraid of overheating the drives. We put the motherboard in the front because it allowed us to put a lot of surface mount components on the PCB for the switch, for the status LEDs, for the debug cards. Uh, and that allowed us to keep um, 
from having to run wires or dongles back and forth between these devices in a front panel. It also uh, allowed us to create a server which was only front access. I noticed that the technicians would go to a server, they would uh, look at the status lights in the front, and then they'd say, okay, there's clearly something wrong. They'd walk all the way around the aisle back to the back of the server, and they would try and unplug it or plug in their console over there, and then they'd realize they had a bad disk because they had to walk all the way around the front of the around the, the aisle again, back to the front of the server, swap out the disk. It created a lot of complexity as far as the service goes. In this particular design, everything is accessed from the front. A technician ne never needs to go to the back of the server or the back of the rack. You can also see the one and a half U design, so this is slightly taller uh, than, than a, a standard one U server. Here are some of the service features we had. Uh, we're a big fan of spring-loaded plungers uh, because they can replace a screw relatively easy and you can remove them without the need for a tool and you can remove them very quickly. The power supply on the top right is held in place with a plunger. Uh, it takes uh, nine seconds for a technician to replace a power supply. We actually did a lot of time and motion studies on the serviceability of the server and found that there was anywhere between a 2x and a 10x improvement on the times it took to do common uh, operations on the server to repair them. Uh, drives are held in place with spring-loaded toolless plungers as well. The motherboard is held in place with a snap-on standoff, uh, so it can just be literally yanked out of the chassis. This is our motherboard. Um, we built two motherboards for the first round of the project. One of them was based on the Intel Tylersburg platform. The other one was based on the AMD G34 socket. Uh, this one in particular is our Intel uh, version of the motherboard. Uh, it has uh, two processors. And other than that, not a lot of extra auxiliary features. We did a lot of the minimum design requirements that Intel really requires you to actually use the system. But other than that, kept out a lot of extra features. Um, one of them was the management port. Many servers have a coprocessor, and that coprocessor sits there. It's usually an ARM 9 core. It's got some DRAM connected to it. It's got a clock, a bunch of passive components. And uh, it'll sit there and monitor temperature, monitor uh, uh, voltage sensors on the board, look at bit errors from the memory, and then report that over a network interface so you can administer your server. Uh, when you have tens of thousands of servers, no one's going to log into a box and really say, hey, is my temperature uh, on the inlet of the server acceptable? All of that is automated. Um, and we actually found that we can access all of those features through the Linux kernel itself. Um, and if we used a desktop style of uh, hardware monitoring chip, which was much cheaper, uh, much lower power than a, a, a coprocessor, we could get away and still get all of that data from the server, but not actually spend the extra money on building out uh, a management processor on there as well. On this particular board, and this just goes uh, to show you how anal we were when we were looking at costs, you can put up to 18 DIMMs on here. Uh, on this prototype board, we actually only have six DIMMs or memory slots on there. And that's because the slots cost $1.50 each. And so by not putting all 18 on there, we didn't have to buy 12 slots or 12 of the connectors uh, and saved us a little bit of money on this particular type of server. Uh, it did, it did uh, uh, um, make it more difficult to upgrade the servers in the future. Uh, so not clear if that was the right decision yet. We'll let you know. Uh, another interesting thing we did here was we spread out the components in the back. The CPUs, the memory, are the hottest components. And they actually receive as much cold air straight from the cold aisle of the data center as possible. We tried not to shadow the components, which actually makes, them, um, uh, makes you cool components with preheated air from another component. This allowed us to slow down the fans in the system much more. Uh, our particular systems will only use between 2 and 3% of total ser server energy to spin the fans. A 1U server uses anywhere between 10% and 20% of total server energy. We added some serviceability components as well. Uh, this is our debug card. Uh, it has a serial port on there, uh, which works at the old school RS-232 voltage signaling levels. And our technicians used uh, old school terminals on their Macs to uh, actually debug and interface the servers as well. Um, uh, this allowed us not to put these RS-232 converters on the motherboard itself. Every technician has this debug card in their pocket. When they come up to a server, they pop it in and they fix it. It's got two seven-segment LEDs on there. Uh, we, we use the old uh, LPT printer port, uh, the pins off of that, to drive these seven-segment seven segment displays. Uh, and that actually gives, uh, we made some modifications to the BIOS, and it gives the technicians some insight as far as 
to what's going on in the server. So if a dim fails, we'll blink a code on the seven segment displayed and that'll notify the technician that this dim needs to be replaced or didn't initialize properly. This is our power supply. Um, I'll point out some of the, the, the key features here. Uh, you'll notice the two input connectors, and they don't look like your typical power supply connectors. That's because we're running 277 volts. Your standard IEC type of plugs will only go to 240 volts, and if you go any higher than that, UL won't certify your power supply. So we use 600 volt connectors over here. There's two of them, one for the 277 volt input, and the other one for the 48 volt input from the battery backup system. Uh, the output connector is only a single voltage on the left, um, black connector, a little bit uh, blurry on this image. And we didn't just do 12 volts, we did 12 and a half volts. And that's also because we were anal, and at 12 and a half volts you have a higher voltage, lower current, and as a result you have less IR losses through your conduction path to the processors. We also paid a lot of attention to efficiency over here. Uh, many power supplies, uh, if you just spec out a standard power supply, it might be 80, 85% efficient. Uh, some of the nicer power supplies you get from the vendors exceed 90%, 93% is good. On this particular supply, um, because we worked very closely with the power supply vendors, we actually exceeded 94.5% efficiency. We did a lot of work on thermal modeling of the server. This is a flow therm model. Uh, and we took a lot of care to ensure that every bit of air going through the server was used as efficiently as possible. Uh, we didn't want uh, to flow unnecessary air through the device because that's wasted energy. Uh, fans that you're driving too fast for no reason. Um, there's actually an air duct, which isn't in the previous images, which I'm showing over here, uh, which helps guide the air over the hot components on the server. Now, um, typical servers in a data center are packaged in a standard 19-inch rack. I don't know why 19-inch became a standard, probably another legacy from the telco days. Uh, but we didn't want to constrain ourselves by using a 19-inch rack. It didn't seem like, like uh, there was any real reason to use that. Uh, so we laid out our server, we laid out the power supply and the motherboard, and we allotted for additional space. Uh, to create those components. Uh, none of those, neither of those are, are standard form factors, nor the power supply or the motherboard. Um, but we did leave plenty of space in there. We wanted the designers not to be constrained by space. We wanted them to focus on efficiency. Um, so we actually had a relatively large motherboard. It's 13 by 13 inches. The power supply is relatively large for its 450 watt power output. Um, but that meant we needed to go and redesign the rack. Now, there's other reasons to redesign the rack other than that, too. Uh, when you operate a site at this type of scale, uh, you are literally building out tens of thousands of servers in every cluster. Uh, a cluster may serve front-end web traffic. We may have a Hadoop cluster, which is doing a lot of data processing in the background. We may have a storage cluster, which is hosting uh, photos for users. Uh, when we build out a new cluster, we don't buy 10 servers, we don't buy 100 servers, we buy them by the thousands. And so the actual logistics of getting thousands of servers into a warehouse in a relatively short amount of time um, is, it can, it can be quite complicated. Uh, some of the things we did with the rack uh, is also uh, similar to what we did on the server. We removed a lot of the requirements for tools on the rack itself. So servers slide in from the front and they're held in place again with our beloved plunger pins uh, to prevent, prevent them from sliding back out. All the cabling is in the front as well. Uh, we, rather than using traditional rails, rails typically have ball bearings in them, they get screwed into place, and they allow the server, just like your drawer in your kitchen, to slide in and out of the rack, supposedly because it's easy to service the box that way. Um, we, we, we did away with those because they added extra cost to the server that we didn't think was necessary. Um, rather than doing that, we had a couple sheet metal panels and we punched tabs out of them, or shelves, and so these servers are basically sitting on shelves, not on rails, and they glide in and out of the shelves just fine. Um, we created some extra provisions or extra flexibility for networking switches in here. Um, typically, uh, a network switch comes with 48 networking ports on there. Again, not sure how we ended up at 48 ports in the industry, but that's what we had. Uh, and we weren't using all of them. We found we were only using 40 of the ports in our standard racks. And that was because 
we could only put 40 servers in that particular type of rack and meet the height requirement that we were targeting for that data center. So we left eight ports unused, which means that we paid a little bit extra because we weren't fully utilizing the switch. We didn't get to amortize the cost of the switch across all the ports. Uh, in this particular rack, we hold uh, servers in groups of 30. So each rack, which is called a triplet, has three columns, 30 servers each. And in those uh, 90 servers total for the rack, and that actually divides by two pretty nicely into two groups of 45. And we can now use 45 ports in the switch rather than just 40, so we're getting more, more benefit out of our switch for the money we paid for it. And we still have three extra ports for expansion or any sort of other flexibility that we'd want in there. So it was a step uh, uh, better than what we were doing before. Um, you can put up to uh, two switches in each one of these columns. So there's standard uh, 1U slots in here for standard networking switches that you can put in there. We didn't quite go to the extent of creating our own custom switch just yet. Uh, and the rack actually rolls really nicely. We have a nice concrete floor in the data center in Prineville. It has nice casters at the bottom. It takes two technicians to push this rack out through the data center and deploy it in its final spot. And just to give you a sense of the scale, um, when we build a, a cluster of tens of thousands of servers, uh, we need to get a lot of material in there. The servers themselves, a lot of the components are manufactured over in Asia. So we do assembly of the server in Asia. The cheapest labor also happens to be there. Uh, we'll take those servers and we ship them over to an integration partner in Fremont. Uh, they're called Cynix. Cynix takes the servers, puts them in our triplet rack. Now the triplet rack is relatively heavy and massive. So we wanted to do that not too far from the data center. We didn't want to ship these massive racks across the ocean. So they actually get built at a company called Daymac in Southern California. They weld them together, they powder coat them, they put them on a truck, they ship them to Fremont. The servers get placed into the rack in Fremont. The network cables are installed. Uh, the uh, power strips are installed as well. These are two custom power strips that we had to design. Uh, and the servers are burned in for a series of several hours to ensure that there aren't any failures. We actually do catch uh, some failures. Now, it's cheaper to catch those failures earlier up in the supply chain. So our uh, server vendor, uh, Quanta, actually has uh, technicians on site who repair the servers, the failed servers, on their own dime. So it ends up being cheaper for Facebook. We'll load up uh, four trucks a day of servers. Each truck has 13 racks on them. Each rack has 90 servers, so you can do the math. Uh, and we'll take those trucks and we'll drive them up to Prineville. It takes about a, a day to get there and we'll unload those four trucks in a day. Every two hours, we unload a truck. We take the racks out, we push them out onto the data center. They get powered up, they're plugged into the network. We do a quick scan or inventory of the components in each server to make sure we actually got what we paid for. Uh, and then they'll get imaged, and within an hour or two, they're online, uh, ready to be installed with a particular application that they're gonna be used for. This is our battery cabinet. Uh, so the cabinet here uh, is actually powering or backing up the two triplet racks that you see on the left and the right. And so uh, uh, we didn't, one of the goals we had was not to distribute DC very far. Uh, typically, uh, when you have a standard UPS, the batteries are all, all in, a, in a room somewhere in the data center, and then you distribute the output of those batteries to the different servers. So you actually need to size the batteries to account for the loss that you get in your distribution. By putting the batteries closer to the servers, we have less losses and therefore can purchase fewer batteries. Another side benefit we found from this clever UPS scheme. Uh, the battery cabinet has a monitoring system in there that checks the impedance of the batteries, notifies us over the network when the battery needs to be maintained or serviced. Uh, it also has a rectifier inside that'll keep a, a charge on the batteries. Uh, when they're not in operation. So the cabinet pretty much sits there, waits for the power to go away. When the power goes away, it discharges, and then when the power comes back, it begins charging the batteries again. Uh, so it actually doesn't have much functionality uh, during normal operation. It actually consumes very little power during normal operation. So, of course, at the end, uh, the finance guys came around and said, cool, you hired a bunch of engineers, you spent a bunch of money on developing hardware, uh, we want to see the bottom line, what, what's the net result of Facebook? Uh, and we tallied a lot of it now. Um, the comparison was made to our typical data center uh, leased facility with the stand industry standard server that we were buying before. Uh, these particular servers 
we uh, started uh, deploying them December 15th uh, of last year. Uh, and we've been, we have about uh, eight months of runtime on them. Uh, and we've been collecting data on them. Uh, the comparison is to a server that we were deploying in, say, 2009, for example. Uh, and actually, during that time frame, there wasn't a major architecture shift in processor. So actually, the performance that we get from them is relatively comparable. We didn't actually change anything uh, to allow us to do any more computational throughput per processor. Um, so on the acquisition cost itself, uh, and this includes both the server and the data center, we, we realized a 24% improvement compared to our previous uh, number, and 38% um, on the energy efficiency. And so for a company who is spending millions of dollars a month on energy bills, on utility bills, this was actually um, a pretty significant win for the company overall. Now, um, if you look at Facebook in general, we did a, uh, the company itself is built on uh, a lot of open source hardware. There was a lot of uh, so soft software. There was a lot of infrastructure that was developed um, by many groups and Facebook was able to leverage a lot of that to build the site itself. If we look at Apache, if we look at Memcache, MySQL, those were a lot of the basic software building blocks that we used. As a result, this company was able to form and provide a, to provide a valuable service to users. Um, the one thing we didn't have was a really efficient mechanism for deploying hardware. And so what we did uh, was take a lot of our designs and we opened them up. And, uh, we did this through something called the Open Compute Project. Uh, and the, the philosophy there is to provide uh, the same type of infrastructure to other startups who might be wanting to also, uh, uh, who might need this type of infrastructure at this type of scale, but to not have them uh, need to jump through many of the hurdles that Facebook did when it was starting up to, to build this type of infrastructure. Uh, and this is a, a pretty major uh, shift in thinking from the rest of the industry. If you look at other companies uh, like Google, like Yahoo or Amazon, they keep a lot of their infrastructure closed. They don't really talk about what's going on uh, behind the scenes in their data centers or what types of servers they use. Uh, and we decided that it really wasn't part of our fundamental business to uh, build out this type of infrastructure. Our, uh, the value that we have is our social graph, is the experience we provide our users. Uh, it's not really in how we build or deploy infrastructure. And as a result, we decided to share a lot of this because there are some benefits we can gain as well. Um, one of them is design input, right? If we share this with other companies who have some of the similar challenges, they may actually come up with a better scheme of doing a UPS system than we did. And we wouldn't have known that had we not shared this with them initially. Uh, so it allows for people to contribute back a lot of their thoughts about how this type of infrastructure can be built. Um, some of the other things that we're looking at when it comes to, to opening it up um, is also helping, uh, I mentioned, foster a lot of the, the next generation startup, but it also can help push the industry forward. So a lot of the other vendors, typical vendors, don't have boxes that are as simple as this, that are as efficient as this. Hopefully they'll take a look at this and see it as an opportunity to go and change their designs or to better tailor their type of products so that uh, the mass market can also use these as well. And it'll help that industry continue to move forward and progress. Uh, because right now, uh, one of the problems we had was getting them interested enough in doing this type of a development for us. They didn't think that enough people would be interested in buying this type of a server. Uh, and a lot of my initial conversations when I first started Facebook were with the typical vendors, and it was a lot of arm wrestling, trying to get them to adopt a better UPS scheme, trying to use a more efficient power supply. And the conversations didn't go very far. Hopefully this will be a kick in the pants to them uh, to try and get them to move forward and move faster and make these types of products available to everyone else. Uh, we get a lot of interest on the particular servers, and we're trying to um, enable other people to use this type of infra infrastructure but without a good partner who has a good distribution scheme, support scheme, uh, sales team to deliver this, um, it's not going to happen. We're not in the business of selling servers. We don't want to be in that business. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's, uh, we need someone else to sort of take this opportunity up and try and deliver it to the, to the masses. So I'm, a little bit, I'm done a little bit early, but that means we have more time for questions if you guys have any. Yeah. Um, one of the things I'm really interested in is um, 
how quickly you feel you need to um, turn a server, like mm -hmm. how fast you need to amortize them. And for example, like going from Nehalem to Westmere, mm -hmm. you get the process step down and I wonder how much, I mean, perhaps there's a more or less a standard thermal right. footprint per package, but right. you're getting a lot more performance. And so I was just kind of wondering how long you typically intend to amortize these things over. Sure. A um, couple parts to that answer. Uh, to give you an overall idea of how long it takes to design a new server, we started this project and really kicked it off in uh, January of 2010. Uh, by the time December 15th came around, that was our, our target date, and that, that date is ingrained in my head, uh, we had the servers on the data center floor already. So the development of the motherboard, the server, the chassis, the power supply took about a year. Um, now for technology transitions, if we go into Halem to Westmere, that's the same socket. That was relatively easy. You do a BIOS update and you're done. Uh, motherboard development can take, uh, if you go very quickly and very fast and loose, maybe nine months. A year is, is really good for that uh, type of time frame. Um, and uh, as far as how long it takes for us to amortize the server, we typically keep them for about three years. Uh, especially for a processor intensive server, something that's maxing out the CPU most of the time. Uh, the problem is, uh, after a certain point, you'll reach a point where the power you're, or the cost of the power you're spending on the server doesn't quite uh, uh, justify its existence in your server fleet. And as a result, you're better off just buying the next generation processor. Actually, we are coming up with the next transition uh, on the server processors from Intel. Uh, it makes sense for us to do a day one or even earlier adoption of that particular process, or of that particular processor, thanks to Moore's law, right? We'll be getting a faster processor with more throughput at the same cost, at the same power envelope. And so if we're buying old servers or, or previous generation processors, we're wasting our money at that point. And so we actually are working very closely with the major vendors to make sure that we can get day one adoption or release date adoption of those particular products. Next question. Um, Todd Besnick, Quantum. A quick question. Are you going to publish experience information on the website? Experience information on? On the website, like failure rates and, you know, anecdotal things like we didn't count on this. And ah, very good question. Uh, you'll get some of that from the upcoming speakers who talk about the different parts of the design. Hmm. That, I actually like that idea. I, we weren't planning on it. One of the things we're, we're looking at doing is taking our actual test criteria, um, which we spent a lot of time developing, which has really morphed from a lot of the uh, types of uh, experiences we had throughout the development, right? Uh, who would have known that you would have had to pay uh, very close attention to the makeup of the uh, thermal grease that you were using on your processor, right? So we developed test criteria around that. Uh, and by releasing our, our test criteria or our acceptance criteria for the particular servers, people can look at that and learn about all the different gotchas and things you need to test for when you, when you develop a server like this. But uh, the more uh, uh, the experiences that are based more around um, you know, interesting tidbits that happen during the development, that, that would, be, uh, well, that would I, be something interesting to publish. Yeah. I was thinking yeah. drive failure rates, mm -hmm. um, server failure rates. Yep things like this that it's hard to get data on that. Yep. And my real question was, what did you do with the software to try to make this work better? Try and make it look try better. To, try to make it more efficient, more energy efficient. Got it. OK. Um, those rates, we are definitely collecting a lot of them. We can publish them in sort of an anonymized fashion without uh, um, you know, raining on the parade of one vendor or another. Uh, I don't think they would appreciate it if we did that uh, and might not want to do business with us in the future if they knew that by selling to Facebook their product would be scrutinized to that extent. Um, but actually it, it would be a benefit to the industry overall if we did that. Something to contemplate and, and I'll do that. Uh, as far as the software goes, um, we have sort of parallel developments trying to uh, improve the efficiency of the software. Logically this server looks almost exactly the same as it did to uh, the traditional type of equipment we were buying. So a software engineer could sit back and not know if they're using an open compute server to run their service or if they're using a Dell standard 1U server to run their service. Uh, some areas where we had software uh, development on here was with uh, kernel drivers 
uh, fan control algorithms, and uh, BIOS logging, error logging within the BIOS. We made some customizations there, but not actual application software. Yep. Bob Stewart, Stewart Research. Uh, could you tell us a list of the components which fail most frequently and how long a typical component will last in your system? Sure. You must uh, have lots of data. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, one of the highest failure rates we had initially was actually the power supply. Um, believe it or not, there's a lot of um, uh, sensitive feedback pins on there that can trigger failures. There's a lot of different components that might just be used slightly out of spec that can fail. Um, the good news is we can flush those out pretty quickly because we can notice when a power supply fails relatively fast. The server goes offline. Um, after the initial few months of, of, uh, of uh, higher than expected failure rates, and it wasn't really that high, it was 2 or 3% around there, um, the failure rates we see are very uh, uh, similar to those of the rest of the industry. So disks fail the most. Uh, DRAM fails the next after that. Um, you get a couple motherboard failures here and there. CPUs almost, ne almost uh, very rarely fail, almost never. Um, and power supplies are somewhere around the motherboard level, too. Uh, the mechanical chassis, nothing really ever goes wrong with those components. Uh, we do get a couple cable failures as well, Ethernet cables or power cords that fail that just weren't built properly from the start. Uh, um, how long does it take to fail? I don't have good data on that yet. Uh, with, like with any new server development, you get a lot of initial failures um, when you first deploy. Um, they eventually taper off once people adjust their manufacturing processes, once you work out some of the bugs. Um, but it, it, it really varies. Once you get past the initial deployment, and a lot of that's covered under warranty anyways, um, you get pretty good runtime on them, and you'll have a sustained failure rate. And I don't think that we've actually had these long enough to trend it over time and to give any meaningful data from that yet. Next question. Thanks. Uh, Gene Boswell with IDC. I'm mm -hmm. um, very interested in what your comments were about the churn rate. Obviously, we're talking about it a little bit here with the refresh rate. Is there any advantage to having a homogenous uh, server rack? And then you were talking about three years. Could it be a shorter period? Mm -hmm. And then you want to refresh it. That's one question. Mm -hmm. The other one is, how many people got involved with the design process? Sure. Um, having a homogenous server rack. So that actually is important to us. It, a lot of our management tools uh, are based around server rack types. We actually have six different types of servers, and we tailor them based on the software application that uses them the most. Uh, so for example, our web front end, the boxes that actually interface the users are a type one rack. And we'll configure that in a very particular way that does that function very well. Uh, as far as the types of CPUs, the amount of memory on there, and uh, um, uh, the mix of those servers within the rack. Uh, it makes management of the rack a, a lot easier. Um, we have six different types of those racks. Uh, and for services that might not consume a lot of servers, like say uh, we need a particular advertising function, they need 100 servers, we'll find one of those six racks that it fits the best on and use it for that. Every new configuration costs us money, has overhead associated with managing it. Uh, and the second part of your question was how many people? How many people? And it also sounded like you'd sort of like to have more partners in the future, mm -hmm. just in terms of manufacturing capabilities, stuff like that. Yep. On the team at Facebook, uh, the actual hardware design team was relatively small. Um, we have about two power engineers, two electrical engineers doing a board design, uh, two thermal engineers. This is probably on average throughout the year. Of course, it changes as people come and go. Um, uh, two mechanical engineers. Uh, myself, so maybe about 10 on the engineering side, uh, two vendor managers helping with all the relationships with the different partners we had. Uh, and then in addition to that, uh, a lot of this was developed alongside with partners. Uh, so Intel, AMD helped us extensively on the motherboard development, used a lot of their resources and, and people to work with us to do uh, board reviews, uh, uh, check schematics, uh, signal integrity type of work. Um, and the people doing a lot of the heavy lifting majority were over in Taiwan uh, at Quanta, where they had, uh, it seems like almost an endless bucket of engineers who are always uh, doing a lot of the nitty gritty detailed work like the layout, placing resistors and components on the boards. Um, 
And then we had a lot of power development done in Europe at uh, Delta Germany and Power One in Italy uh, is where they did a lot of the intricate power, power design. To me, oftentimes that seems more like an art form. Um, and the Italians are very creative in that sense. Uh, if I look at the project overall, I could say there was easily 100 people involved. Within Facebook, 10, 12 people. Thank yeah. you. Sure. Hi, Charlie Demergen, Semi-Accurate. Mm -hmm. um, you touched on this a little earlier with the different types of racks for different uses. Mm -hmm. um, do you design software for hardware, hardware for software? Yes. And where does this leave uh, the elephant in the room, which is uh, non-X86 processors? Sure. Um, interesting. If it was up to me, we would design uh, the software for the hardware, being a hardware guy. Um, but actually, that, that's actually one of the next challenges. We did a very close coupling between the data center and the server. The next challenge is to do a very tight coupling between the software and the hardware. I mentioned before, logically, this almost looks the same to the software engineer. Uh, and we basically took the easy route and designed something that could fit straight into the software environment. And we were able to do that because there was so much low-hanging fruit to justify the project and the time and, and the resources that we put into it. And we got those efficiencies without doing that deep um, integration between the two. Um, so the answer is we designed, we designed the hardware for the software in this first round. Uh, we're on to, uh, we're going to be starting more involved projects doing the exact opposite or meeting in the middle more or less. Uh, and the second part of your question was? Um. Software, oh, hardware, and then? I don't remember. OK. Oh, oh yeah, not, not x86. x86. Got it. Um, <laughs> yes, we look at those all the time. We actually have uh, a lot of vendors who come to us with alternate architectures. If it's ARM, Tylera, um, uh, Atom, those types of processors are all very interesting. And we run a lot of benchmarks on them to qualify and see where they exist. Um, some of them have limitations today. We need ECC memory. We need 64 bits. A lot of our code uh, is fairly modern, runs 60, requires 64 bit um, support. Uh, so there's challenges with some of them. And those vendors haven't quite made it yet to the point where they can be a drop in replacement um, as far as the features go, uh, if you compare it to the x86 options that are out there today. Yeah. Okay. Jeff Pangborn, Cavium. I was wondering whether. Uh, you perform any kind of compliance testing or standards testing as some of the traditional vendors of enterprise servers would have to perform if they were to sell their products internationally. Mm -hmm. And as an offshoot of that, your product is currently, uh, as you described, in Oregon um, with the kind of spring plunger design you use. Would that kind of work in earthquake prone locations as Facebook expands its networks across the world? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so, um, let me see. As far as the, the, the spring plunger goes, the rack itself isn't, or standards in general. So our overall goal, goal there was to not kill the data center technician. Um, and there's a lot of dangerous components in these particular server racks. Uh, some of them, we have time for one more question after this one, sorry, because uh, I'm already at, at the one hour mark. Um, after um, uh, a lot of the high voltage components are actually UL certified and they comply with all of the standards that are out there. We actually have a whole long list in the power supply spec of the standard that this needs to, um, uh, needs to adhere to. And so uh, the high voltage things, anything that has a, a human life a safety concern, all of that is, is, um, is, uh, complies with the industry standards. Aside from that, the, ser the server itself uh, doesn't meet standards primarily because we have an EMI issue. Right. You don't want to interfere with other people's devices. This is our data center. I don't really care if I interfere with my own device. It doesn't really matter at that point. Uh, we actually contain EMI within the building. Um, and uh, that's how we get around that. Uh, as far as earthquake safety, uh, you're right. Prineville isn't, a, isn't zone 4 rated. The battery cabinet that we design is a zone 4 rated rack. Uh, the rack itself, we haven't done any seismic testing on it yet. Um, but the servers are, uh, for my back of the envelope type of experience would, uh, are, are definitely difficult to uh, remove from there if the plunger is in place, if the power connectors are in place. So we're not too concerned about that. Yep. 
Songbom Kim uh, from VMware. Uh, what is the typical CPU utilization of your data center? And my second question is, have you considered virtualizing your data center? Sure, CPU uh, utilization and virtualization, interesting. So CPU utilization depends on the tier. Uh, our web tier actually utilizes the CPU pretty well, around 40% or so, which is, I think, pretty high if you compare it to the rest of the industry. But those are processes that require a lot of CPU power. And if you graph that, we actually get two peaks, one during the US day and one during the European day. And then it kind of flattens out during Asia's daytime when they're using the site, and then you get the two peaks again. Um, but we need to build enough capacity to sustain those two peaks. And in the event uh, someone like Michael Jackson passes away and the site gets a lot of traffic, we need to sustain that peak as well. Um, virtualization is interesting. We actually don't virtualize or use any sort of uh, virtualization layer. Uh, we design applications and assign servers according to specific function or application. And then we, will, uh, we can dynamically, and we have a project going on where we can dynamically shift workloads from one server to another depending on how they're used. Uh, but it doesn't require, um, it doesn't have any sort of traditional virtualization in that type of implementation. So I went a little bit over, but thank you guys for listening. Um, next up, we'll have Aron Tal, who will talk about our uh, storage solutions. All right, this is on. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah? All right because you're stuck with this. Is this the clicker? So while Amir gets us uh, ready to go here, a little bit background about myself. Um, I joined Facebook about a year and a half ago, um, joined the Open Compute Server team, uh, started off by working on a bunch of the, the smaller things, uh, validation process, component selection, all the ins and outs that, uh, that you have to, to tie in in order to complete a server project. Um, and then about a year ago, I shifted my focus towards um, trying to figure out what we should do with our storage solutions. So I'll start off a little, by talking a little bit about the, uh, the storage tiers that we have today. Um, Amir mentioned that we have six tiers in total at Facebook. Three of them are storage dedicated and they're called three, four, and five in the order that they were incepted. The first one is the MySQL database and that's where most of our user data, where the social graph uh, information is stored. The type four uh, tier is a Hadoop based tier and uh, we use it for storing our uh, um, basically site activity data, and we also use that tier for doing all sorts of analytics and computations on that data to figure out what is trending positively and what isn't. Uh, the fifth storage tier is uh, dubbed Haystack um, after the file system that Facebook created uh, for it. Um, it's used for our photo, our video, and our email attachment storage. Um, nowadays, all of our storage tiers are based on what is more or less considered a standard uh, 2U, uh, 12 hard drive uh, so storage server. Um, we purchase these from the, from the major OEMs and we use the same shell for all these three different tiers but with different stuff options. So talk a little bit about the, the database tier. Um, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a MySQL database that runs an InnoDB engine. Um, the main challenge that we have with our database systems is a, uh, a bottleneck of, of hard drive IOPS. An IOP is basically a single hard drive operation that serves data. That data could be in different block sizes, but um, it's, it's an individual transaction compared to other data retrievals. Um, the, the issue that we see sometimes with the database systems is that we, we, we kind of get a, the, the Michael Jackson event, if you will, but it may be even more um, uh, hard to define or, or notice that it's about to happen. And we will get a certain number of boxes that uh, suddenly become very hot and see a lot of activity. And at that point, we run into situations where the hard drives may be the bottleneck. In order to overcome that, we implemented a uh, secondary layer of cache, if you will, to the DRAM in the system by installing a PCI Express-based uh, flashcard. So overall, these, these systems have a lot of RAM, 144 gigs of RAM, um, on two dual cores that don't have to have major horsepower. 
the lowest level of storage is one terabyte SATA drives in, in a RAID 10 array. Um, and we have the, uh, the flash PCI Express based card as the, uh, the secondary layer of cache that I mentioned. The next tier is the Hadoop based tier. As I mentioned, it's, it's where we store our data. This is a distributed file system. And so the use of RAID or any sort of other hardware backed uh, redundancy methods aren't required. Um, it's basically managed by the file system itself and is distributed across many nodes. Our current uh, deployment of Hadoop has a built-in redundancy of 2.2x. And we don't really have system bottlenecks in, in, in these systems. Um, basically the way these machines are used is to crunch a bunch of numbers and store a bunch of data um, for internal use. And so if we run out of hard disk step space, we try to just erase some of the old data that's probably unnecessary. If, we're, um, if we start getting too many engineers or there's too, many, too much uh, number crunching going on, then we run out of CPU power. And at that point, it's time to purchase more systems. Uh, oops, sorry, just to go back real quick. One thing I want to point out is in these cases, we're using the highest capacity SATA drives, enterprise drives we can find out there. And we also use pretty powerful uh, X5650 um, Intel-based CPUs. So storage and uh, number crunching, of course, both very critical. The last storage tier that we have is, is dubbed Haystack, as I mentioned. Haystack is a custom-built file system. And the main point with building Haystack was to be able to reduce the latency time for the retrieval of a photo that is not in cached in a CDN or in our caching uh, layers um, in the minimum amount of time to the user. And so it was important to come up with a file system that in a single operation could retrieve a photo from a disk. And the way we did that is we basically created very, very large files that are made up of um, many small appended files that actually carry the photos. And then we store indices to the locations of different photos within the main file in RAM. And that basically allows retrieving a photo almost immediately from the system. The biggest challenges we have with Haystack it comes from uh, rebuild and recovery. So we run a RAID 6 configuration on these machines, which means that there are two redundant drives carrying parity information for the, for the 10 main drives uh, carrying the data. This means we can afford to lose two drives before we, we have a data loss on that system. Um, in the case of a drive failing, we take the drive out, put in a new drive, then a rebuild proce process starts where basically the parity information you use to recalculate the missing data and write it to that, that disk. As disk drives are growing, that time is going up. We're approaching a full day for a three terabyte drive. And in the cases of a whole system going down, we do have duplicates of these systems in other locations, but a coast-to-coast -coast copy of a full system over one gigabit ethernet could take, for example, a week. So those are the main challenges that we see with, with Haystack going forward. So when I was brought onto the team, um, the, the charter that I was given by Amir was, okay, well, we have a rack that you guys have seen. We have a power supply, we have data center infrastructure, and we have a server. Um, we just don't have storage. So my goal was to build something that would work for all these applications that I just mentioned, but would leverage all the work that we've already done. Um, and this meant that keep the spirit of freedom, so have the easy assembly, easy integra in integration, and uh, maintenance-friendly design. Um, and one other thing that we kind of wanted to, to make sure that we enable with the solution is that we can accommodate uh, potential changes in the fleet or the system architecture. So talk a little bit about what, what Nox is. Um, we're basically taking the open compute server and interfacing it to something that is more or less like a JBOD or what we call an RBOD because it carries a RAID controller. And I'll go into more detail about that architecture in a bit. In a traditional direct attached storage system, which is one such as the 2U12 server that I showed at the beginning of the, the presentation, basically a PCI Express interface, which is the host bus interface, is used to connect the CPU with the RAID controller that then interfaces to all the cards. PCI Express, by its nature, by its original intent, is a point-to-point -point type of bus with a, uh, with a host and a target. It's supposed to be single host, single target. As I mentioned to you guys, 
in, for example, the haystack situation, we don't really use a lot of compute and we don't use a lot of memory. So provided that we had the, the build, RAID build, rebuild times that we needed and provided that we had more Ethernet bandwidth, which is coming for recovery, we would like very much to attach many NOXs, many storage units, to a single compute head node. This will help reduce the overall cost. Connecting multiple um, targets to a single server over PCI Express is possible with today's technology because a CPU has many PCI Express ports which you can attach to. However, in the Hadoop case that I mentioned to you guys, we don't really need that much storage. As I mentioned, we're kind of on a good balance between compute and storage. And so if I were to build a very big tub of drives for, a, uh, for the Hadoop type of scenario, the engineers wouldn't really be able to make any usage of the storage. They need more compute for the storage. And so one of the things that we would have liked to do is be able to build this big JBOD or RBOD box, but connect multiple heads nodes to it. Nowadays, uh, PCI Express uh, IO virtualization and bridging, which allows connecting multiple hosts onto the same bus, is somewhat in its infancy. There's a few concepts out there. It's still in development. It could be done, but it's not quite ready for, for mass deployment. And so we did some, um, I guess you could say, brute force uh, design at the board level to get over this in the meantime. But really what we're trying to drive to, what our, what our future hopes and visions are, is being able to build a rack that has a certain number of servers, it has a, a certain amount of storage, and it has a common backplane that can be used as a switch for both and allows you to configure your rack and configure your storage to server as you wish without having to pre-design the hardware to that ratio. Still a ways to go there, but that is what we're eyeing in the future. Just a little bit of a review of um, how, how, these, how this hardware will come together. So a review of the open compute server. The image that you actually see here, Harry, um, the motherboard designer on the server side, we'll go into more detail later, is our next generation design. And it is actually has two uh, servers in, in a single chassis, the same chassis as the first generation of the open compute. Uh, we have two HDD slots that have actually been moved to the front here. Uh, we still have the Freedom Power Supply uh, now in the back, and we have two motherboards. This image is of what the Knox uh, storage system is intended to look like. It is basically two big tubs of, t of 25 drives, or two sub-chassis of 25 drives in a big tub. We have the fans in the back. We have redundant power supplies on the, the right side. The whole assembly will slide out on, a, on, um, on slides from the rack, enabling hot plug replacement of the drives. Uh, the height of the, the storage system is 4.5U, and, and that was in part to continue with the, with the resolution, if you will, or the step size that we use on our racks of 1.5U, which was optimal for, for the thermal management of the data center and the servers. So a Type 4 configuration, as the Hadoop configuration, the heavy compute configuration, would look something like this on a rack. You would have an open compute server with two motherboards above, an open compute server with two motherboards below, and you would interface to the Knox unit that has 50 drives. Um, one cable, one PCI Express cable for each 12 or 13 drives since it's an odd number, 25. The Type 5 rack configurations here is shown with the, the original open compute server on the left. Uh, well, might be mixed up left and right. And on the other side, uh, uh, the, the new open compute server. The idea here is, as I mentioned, on the Type 5, since we don't use a lot of compute, we don't use a lot of memory, increasing overall rack density and the amount of drives for a single server solution is really where we're going to see the most benefit in cost efficiencies. So talk a little bit about what are the advantages that we see with Knox and with breaking up the storage and the server uh, units as opposed to the classic or traditional solution that we have today of the two U12 uh, servers. Um, one is that we're, as I mentioned, and it was part of the goal of this project, was to leverage the already existing infrastructure that we built. 
Um, another one is that, as I mentioned, we would like to be able to have some sort of dynamic control over the compute to storage ratios that we have. Um, in some cases, we need more storage. In some cases, we need less. But we'd like to achieve it with the same fundamental hardware. It also enables us to basically separate out development of server and storage. If you think about it from a program perspective, um, there's a lot of dependencies that, that start coming up as you're building a piece of hardware. And so being able to modularize and decouple your hardware enables you to develop to separate roadmaps and deal with bumps on the road in one program that won't then slide into and affect another program. It is also a first step in the direction of a universal rack, which is more along the, 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 along the lines of the concept that I was talking about before, where we could use some sort of interface as a, uh, as a backplane to switch between servers and storage and allow us to basically determine as our customer uh, usage and demand changes, what is the right amount of server and storage to deploy without having to do any redesign. Another benefit of, of, of the Knox infrastructure or the big tub of drives infrastructure is um, the reduction of that hotspot effect that I mentioned on the database tier. So basically having a bigger pool of drives means more uh, IOPS that are available to a single head node or a single database instance, and therefore the potential to alleviate some of that, some of that pressure. And as I mentioned, in today's world, our, our haystack and database tiers, they're not really CPU bound. And so being able to put more storage to compute will help uh, reduce our overall capex. So talk a little bit about the, the controller board architecture that we, we plan to use in order to enable this magical multiple head nodes of PCI Express going into a single box. Well, really what we're doing is quite simple we're placing a separate con uh, RAID controller for each potential head node and just putting them down on one board. They then share an expander because a single expander is enough to talk to all the drives. Um, but as I mentioned, in order to be able to, to handle the, the individual uh, head nodes, we need a different controller. Um, the nice thing is, is the way we're designing this controller board is that you can basically configure it at assembly, at PCB assembly, per your need. So for in the Hadoop configurations, we need two controllers, as we mentioned. But for the Haystack configuration, we really need only one controller. And so it is totally possible to pull out and remove the second controller, and the rest of the board works as is. In fact, we took it a little bit further. Um, in the case that we decided that we did not want to use PCI Express, or in a case where we didn't need a RAID controller, and a SAS interface was available from the head node, we also uh, created the option on this board to remove both RAID controllers and just have a attachment of SAS, basically making this um, as similar to any regular JBOD. This is what the physical layout of the controller board looks like. It's pretty symmetric. Um, two RAID controllers, expander in between them. You have the connector stuff options. Either one or the other would be placed, PCI Express or SAS. And then from the bottom of the card, we mate to the backplane that actually connects to the drives. That mating connection carries the SAS routes from the expander to the hard drives. And here are some, just some renderings of, of what the chassis looks like. Um, this is a, a top, top look, if you will. Um, we, in this design, we have the, the fan tray in the back. Um, this is something that we're still kind of battling with, whether the appropriate location or fans are in the front or in the back. The current feeling is, is that this is the, the, the better layout. This is a picture of what the, the chassis looks like extended outside of the rack. Another picture rear side, if you will. Um, another, another front side picture showing a, a potential front panel. And this shot basically shows a single bucket, a single unit of the 25 drives. Um, and actually shows how the controller board mates to the side of the drives, and you can see underneath the drives is the hard drive backplane that interconnect, interconnects drives to controller board. And this is a front shot that also uh, it will sh kind of shows you the, the spacing and the, uh, the uh, orientation, if you will, of the controller cards and the drive cages. And so that's all I have, and so I'll be happy to take uh, any questions. 
was going to ask you a little bit about um, whether you, you're using three and a half inch drives at the moment. Yes, we are using three and a half inch drives. Have you, I guess there's a question about sort of um, how much bandwidth you might want to get in, in comparison to storage, but as you mentioned with these big drives now, it, it's, you know, sort of problematic because the bandwidth to a drive relative to the storage is not, not going in a good direction. So I was wondering if you'd considered um, maybe going to the two and a half inch form factor and packing a whole bunch more stuff into those. And also I think the power footprint on those is a lot smaller. Yep, so it really comes down to uh, a cost economy. Um, three and a half inch SATA enterprise drives are the cheapest way to get a terabyte nowadays um, in, in the enterprise world. Uh, three, and a half inch tera, uh, three and a half inch drives go up to three terabytes today. Two and a half inch, I believe, are at 900 gig or one terabyte roughly. Um, so the, the, big, the big reason to stick with three and a half is just because that's how you get capacity quickly and, and economically, and that's our number one, number one goal. Um, I'm blanking on the other points you made, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, so absolutely agree on the, on the power footprint. Um, it is better on a two and a half inch drive, but uh, when we do the overall economics, the three and a half inch drive still wins, though we are actually trying to think as much as possible about how do we power off or r reduce the power of drives that are not hot as much as possible. And there's, there's a number of different ways of going about that. I definitely see that as a major issue or a major item to solve uh, going forward. Um, as far as data rates, we actually don't, we rarely use the disks at their full bandwidth and full capacity. There are times where that is of, of benefit, especially during recovery times directly from box to box. Um, however, the deltas between the three and a half and two and a halves are not that major. And even further, our bottleneck always ends up being networking. Even at 10 gigabit, it's gonna be networking. And so, yes, there is a, an advantage with two and a half inch performance, but we're gonna choke it down somewhere else anyways before, before we can in, enjoy it. All the storage device, like a HDD or solid state disk, have a limited lifetime. What is the life expectancy for those devices? Um, so I'm, you know, I'm not 100% sure. I believe that it would be between three to five years. Um, part of it is, depends on the arrangements that you will make with your OEM or your component vendor, depending on, on the business. I, I don't remember what the data sheet of the drive guy says. In general, we design our servers for at least three years. Storage could be longer. What kind of provision or reservation, percentage of reservation in the storage capacity? So basically, how much, uh, how much open capacity do we yes. have? I, I honestly don't know the answer. Okay. Um, I, as far as numbers, I can tell you that behaviorally, the way we deal with it is we at least, for example, in the Haystack case, we have a certain number of boxes that are open, are basically taking incoming traffic, and we know that this size is sufficient to be able to handle uploads without causing the users any problems. So we basically open up on the Haystack side as many boxes as we need. Um, database operates a little bit differently because the database actually grows in the system over time. So you actually have to allocate space for potential future data that will come into the database. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, we actually have quite a lot of space open on our database tiers for what we expect to be database um, information that will come in the future. How Sorry, I can't the, give you an exact no number. Problem. How about the IOPS number? Um, what is the IOPS capability of the system, you That's mean? right. Um, usually it's, it's limited by the drives. So uh, standard drive, I wanna say, ha can, I mean, again, it depends if you're talking 10, two and a half, then? three and a half, 72K, 15K, but it's in anywhere from about 100 IOPS to maybe 300 IOPS. Okay, thank you. Uh, Satoshi Matsushita NEC. Uh, my question is about the uh, refresh of the hardware or the migration of new hard disk drive. Because, uh, every year, the hard disk capacity of the hard disk is changed, increasing, and the, the how you do you, uh, I think that the, the, for the normal rate, situation, the whole, all the disks should be, the drive is the same. How do you think about the, the migration of the 
for refreshment of the hardware? So I, that's a good question. I'm actually not sure, say, so we obviously have one terabyte, two terabyte, and three terabyte, two U12s, because in the past few years, we've gone through those transitions. So I think what you're asking is, do you put a three terabyte in that one terabyte mm -hmm. system? I think the answer is no. I think we do keep the capacities the same, just to keep things simple from a management perspective. I mean, I think think might be a little bit of a problem with the RAID controller if you have one drive that's out of size and it can cause other management issues that I'm probably not even foreseeing. So my expectation is, is that we have replacement drives for all the capacities of systems that are live and running right now. Okay, thank you. I have a question regarding um, your Type 3 servers and you mentioned how occasionally there can be small number of servers that just get clogged with requests. What are your software or hardware contingencies that you have to prevent such a massive bottleneck? So I don't know too much about this phenomena as far as, and I think in general we have a hard time um, uh, predicting when something like this can happen. And so I can't really speak to what we've done from the software perspective strictly, but the uh, uh, PCI Express flash-based card that we use in the system is basically that remedy. And getting that card to work per our requirements actually required a lot of software and kernel work. So you could say that this solution is part hardware, part software to deal with the, with the bandwidth issue. In, in general, um, you know, if, if, you wanted, if you want to solve the IOP problem, you likely have to throw flash at it. All right, thank you. Oh, yes, Brian Holden, the Hypertransport Consortium. Uh, I assume uh, uh, that you do hot swaps on the individual drives in, in the bucket. So you have any special uh, uh, cable management or trays or uh, guides and that sort of thing to, to allow you to pull the, the shelf out and, and be able to, without unplugging everything? And, you know. Yeah. Um, so actually, I, if I hadn't run myself out of this, I'd probably be able to go back and show you. But the whole, um, the whole assembly slides out. Right. All four and a half U50 drives come out. They are all hot. The assembly that comes out carries the power supplies with it. So there will be cabling to, in the front of the rack going to the system that will be have to pull it out and left dangling in order to pull this out. But at that point, you have direct access to all of the drives and you can hot plug them and the system remains powered on. Hi, Charlie Demergent, semi-accurate. Um, uh, some sectors of the industry are going to decoupling compute from storage to networking to everything else. You guys are taking the opposite approach of tight, as tightly coupling and as tightly predicting what resources need to be bundled. Do you foresee the ability to decouple everything so you can just have a lot of storage plus a lot of um, uh, compute, a la what Cisco's trying to do? And what are the impediments there? Um, so, you know, I, as far as, as where, where our infrastructure may be headed going forward, it's I'm somewhat limited in my knowledge of, of where we're headed and what will or won't work for us. A lot of it depends on, on fundamental decisions of how you want to lay out your, your infrastructure. Um, in many ways, we're trying to morph slowly. And what I mean by that is the first step is building a piece of hardware that looks exactly the same as the old hardware, um, but hopefully has in it the hooks, i.e. the PCI Express, to take us to a point where we are more decoupled, still within the rack, but one where you can vary the amount of, of server to storage. Going outside the rack and trying to, to basically do the balancing and provisioning on that level, I don't know that we've looked into that that much, but it could be that something that we will determine is useful in the future. In which case, building these building blocks separately kind of helps us start that, that journey. All right, thanks guys. So I think now it's a break. Our first speaker is, is Harry Lee, who's the uh, lead hardware designer for this system that you've been, you've been hearing about. Uh, he joined Facebook uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, prior to that, he was a motherboard designer at Tian Computer, and he has a PhD from Shanghai Zhao Tong University, which I'm sure I pronounced wrong. No, that's correct. Mm. <laughs> Good enough. Thank you, thank you. Hi, everyone. Oh, okay, it's online. 
Yeah, that's a... Uh... Okay. So in next uh, 30 uh, uh, minutes, I will more focus talking about our uh, Facebook customized server design. I'm Harry Lee. Uh, yeah, just being introduced. Actually, I, I, I joined uh, in 2010, early 2010, into the Facebook. Once I joined, I, I uh, right away get into the, the first generation Facebook customized server design. So as Amir and Aron already mentioned, we have uh, totally six tiers of server application. Aron already covered uh, type three, four, and five, which is more storage based. And my design target um, will be type one, two, and six. And also this service will function as a compute node to pair with Knox su uh, storage subsystem to meet the, the storage use case. So for type one um, is our web front end tier application. So I listed here is, you can see is which kind of uh, server component area this application can benefit most from. So web tier front end will benefit from the CPU core count and frequency, and also the memory speed. For type two, which, has, which is our uh, mem cache tier, which will most benefit from the memory density. For the type six is our special service tier, which uh, meet a special service use case like search, like newsfeed. It will benefit from both um, CPU core count, the frequency, the memory densities, and also some cases need a flash card, PCI Express flash card, to provide another layer of the cache. So based on these design targets, type one, two, six, this requirement, at first we search around uh, in the market to see what standard server multiple can fit in or not. But we find out there is several areas it's missing, it's not fitting our needs. So first is a standard form factor. So you, you will know that standard server multiple will definitely follow some standard form factor defined by the uh, different forum. So they share the same dimension, uh, same mounting hole positions, IO uh, locations, and even some key component placement. In order to, as Amir just mentioned, we kind of integrate the server design to our data center, data center design so tightly. So standard form factor doesn't play well in our environment. And also because uh, this uh, standard design all this uh, standard motherboard is targeted to meet wide target audience. They try to integrate a lot of features in, the, in one motherboard, which a lot of them, we actually don't use it, but we have to pay for it. So it's not, not good for the cost percent, uh, point of view. And also on the power conversion in the motherboard design, they more focus on the cost, lower cost, rather than power efficiency, but that's also kind of opposite with what we want. So then we ha come down as a decision to go through the customized server multiple design path. Now I will talk about some uh, design choices we made and why we, we make that. So first is dual source CPU and motherboard. We kind of uh, enable both major CPU vendors to have a motherboard for that design and also dual source motherboard through the vendors. That's a kind of limited the risk is on our supply chain. And also definitely we reduce the features, just pay for what we use. That's a benefit for our TCO analysis. And another big part is on the IO rearrangement, optimization. So first priority one is how to make it to be service friendly. We move a lot, uh, almost all uh, external IO to be front access to get this better serviceability, which kind of appreciated a lot by cur uh, current deployment, the data center technician. And also we introduced a PCI Express external link, which can give us uh, extensibilities in the future usage. 
For example, you, will, uh, you already see in the Knox uh, storage design, we already been using the, that to bridge the compute node and the storage subsystem. And also definitely the power efficiency is a major target we put into the multiple requirement. So for the major voltage regulator to supply the power to the CPU and memory, we meet the efficiency uh, above 91% from the 30% loading to the 90% loading, this range. So this dramatically also reduce our TCO. And also by doing a one multiple design and use different bomb option to, to build different skill, we meet uh, both web tiers requirement and also memcache re tier requirement. And in the multiple, as you know, we definitely have a, like, for example, a G34. When we designed it, it's the first generation of the G34. And we know down the road, uh, AMD will come out another upgrade version, which can drop in replace, just like Westmere drop in replace uh, in the Helen. So we do put, also put that into account uh, uh, in the design. So we can enable a low cost on the upgrade path. So another big portion we uh, consider uh, a lot is a BMC. As you know, BMC is a baseboard management controller. That's a dedicated management um, controller which provide out-of-band access. That's uh, pretty much um, in every server multiple nowadays. But we do uh, judge the, the value to put a BMC there compared with how much we use it. At that time, we kind of uh, introduced a new feature called a reboot online feature to provide the remote system reset functions, which can bring the system back live if something happens on the system, but we don't need the BMC involved. So basically for that is reuse a wake up pin from the LAN chip to uh, put on circuit to route it to do the system reset. And this way we kind of remove the, the needs for the, for the BMC for the remote access. And also for the debug card, me also mentioned has a picture on that is how easily we can use the debug card in the front access, how pluggable uh, every technician can take one and uh, plug it and do some uh, debug uh, and then remove it and walk away. So the debug card itself will provide the, the system status code, uh, bias postcode, if you will, and also point out the, if there is a DIN errors and also provide the uh, serial connections. So you can hook up the console reduction to see the, how the service goes. So here, the, here we are is we um, come out Intel two socket motherboard. This uh, detail spec is actually available in co Open Compute Project website. You can download it and read through all the detail um, specs. Um, about how we design the service, what's the requirement, what's the features. So here I just uh, pull out as a simple diagram. So you can see how um, simple uh, the, the multiple of components wise become like this. So the only PCI Express um, onboard device is a LAN chip. We put two LAN chip there. Uh, one is a low end, one is high end, so we can do bomb option to accommodate a different requirement for the one gigabit ethernet. And, and also for the South Bridge, you only get the SATA USB out and use a simple hard monitor chip to, to fulfill the local uh, system health monitoring. So you already see this picture. This is our uh, finished product, Intel two socket uh, Westmere motherboard. And uh, it, it shows it's a spread core design. It's benefit the, the thermal because there, uh, for this memory CPU, this is the hottest part in the server. They don't have a preheated part in front of it. It'll benefit our thermal a lot and save fan power. So I will go a little bit quick because I think you already kind of familiar with that in the previous uh, presentation. And for the AMD two, so two socket motherboard, here is, a, and again, there's a, a block diagram. And from this, you will see it's, on the I.O. portion, is pretty much the same. We keep this uh, exactly uh, as much as possible close to each other. So for technician side, it's the same operation experience. 
And for the CPU, uh, G34 does support more um, DIMM slots than Intel Westmere, uh, which is uh, 24 versus uh, 18. So it comes out this motherboard, and we use AMD board for the mem cache tier because that's a more memory density uh, needs and use Intel um, boards for the type one, which is uh, core count frequency and memory speed requirement. So here is a whole chassis view. Um, yeah, you already see that uh, in previous presentation. And it pretty much, you can see is the motherboard in the, in the front together with the power supply to provide easy front access and in between the fan and, and uh, the motherboard, you have uh, three hard drive cage to hold up to six hard drives. And for the motherboard is two list uh, standoff. So basically you can remove the motherboard from the chassis without any tools. So that's also a design philosophy we keep going on to maintain this two list service. So now is, uh, this is what we have for today's deployment, deployment in our data center. Now we are looking for what we do in, for 2012, how we can use the new technology introduced to better uh, meet our TCO um, requirements and to improve the system design to even drive, uh, get lower TCO. So in 2012, there will be new generation of uh, Intel platform, which can give us a higher performance um, benefit from the new microarchitecture, and definitely more core count will be in each uh, CPU. And more memory channel will be supported, and higher memory speed. And PCI Express gets being moved to the, uh, even closer to the CPU is actually inside it, and have more PCI Express lanes available for us to use externally or internally. And also on the AMD, also have a new uh, next uh, die shrink uh, CPU comes out, which have provide high performance with more core count. So to better use this um, <clears throat> new technology introduced by the major CPU vendor, we have think about how we can best use it and at the same time to um, get best, better system design. So here comes an, our new design architecture, which is actually in development right now. Uh, the first is uh, we, we maintain the 1.5U chassis form factor. So this way we can pretty much leverage major part of the rack design. We don't need to change the rack. And inside of the chassis, we integrated two servers uh, instead of just one, uh, like now. The, the two servers, uh, in order to make it more kind of a serviceability, we designed the multiple tray to be able to, um, uh, to provide easy hot swap uh, capability for either uh, CPUs, when you service, it doesn't impact the one beside it. We swap the, inside the chassis, we swap the hard, uh, hard drive position with the power supply to give a more front accessible on the hard drive. Because each hard drive is associated with one server, we have to provide easy access so technician doesn't need to remove the whole chassis to service one server and definitely more I.O. expansion uh, benefit from more APX Express lanes coming out from the CPU. So we actually um, still maintain one uh, by 16 PCIe slot, but by tweaking a little bit on the PCIe riser and also I.O. front, we can accommodate two standard profile um, PCIe uh, cars. We can see later on. And also we can, uh, we support a design option to have a mezzanine car support. So you can see we, we uh, put more kind of I.O. extensibilities into the server. Also, we uh, improve the management capability. As you recall, we use Reborn LAN uh, mainly for the remote access. And in this genera uh, in next generation, we improved the, the, um, the, uh, the management capability uh, to add in the serial over LAN uh, for the remote access and also do power on off in, uh, instead of just a reboot. For the debug car, we still keep uh, the design philosophy is easy to use, front access, hot pluggable, to provide the, the debug code and also serial connections locally. 
So here it is. Here is our uh, next generation uh, server looks like. As you can see, we, uh, the power supply being moved to the back, but with AC-DC cable routed to the front. So we still is uh, front access. And hard drive has been uh, swapped to the front on the, on the right end. There, is, there are two 3.5 inch SATA hard drives can be installed. Each hard drive is linked with each server tray. And beside the power supply, uh, there is a mid plane which actually bridge the, the power supply, motherboard, the fan all together. And you can see they still maintain all the front access I.O. That's uh, so going into a little bit detail, uh, this is a special uh, design uh, for the motherboard tray. As you can see, the gray part is the tray. So the motherboard will be sliding in. It's a tourist, so it's just basically through in, and there is some stripe. You can lock the, the board into the tray. And when the tray is sliding in, you can see the three highlight point. One is on the right end. That's actually the mating point. We have put a stopper there to guide, the first function is guide the tree at the final mating stage and also provide the stop function so the tree doesn't go into too further to give too much strength on the power connector set on the middle plane. And also on the side, you can see a lot of a guide slot there to help the, the tree get into place. Um, in the front, uh, that's a little bit of special piece is we call it the tree ejector. So it provide uh, several functions. The, the first is, is a PCIe bracket holder, which can use to hold two PCIe card in place. Another is become a lock position. So when you slide in the tray into the chassis, there you will feel there is a click uh, position. So you know the tray already being pulled in to the correct position. And when you want to remove the tray, the ejector become the first uh, um, um, help you to overcome the, the mating strength on the power connector to make it easy to be um, uh, pulled out. So here is the IO extensibility. You can see how we make it to accommodate, accommodate two PCIe card in a 1.5U uh, height chassis. Pretty much it's, it's take um, all use of this uh, front space. And you can see on the right corner, um, there will be a mezzanine car sit on there. So mid plane is another piece. Um, I think you, most of you are familiar with the back plane. That's used a lot, very common in the server. But back plane, um, most of the time, is quite a complicated design. Uh, for, for, for mid plan here, we want to make it simple because it's a sit, on, sit in the, the chassis. It's not easy to be swapped. You have to remove the whole tray. So we have to make, uh, want to make sure the design is uh, simple. Um, but it has to provide several functions. First is uh, power delivery. So it bridge from uh, uh, power supplies, uh, DC output, and to the motherboard for the, for the DC power delivery. So this way, we can re definitely still maintain the blind mating to remove the power cable and also provide the trays uh, sliding out. Um, to, to make the hot swap uh, uh, available, we put a hot swap controller in the mid plane, which provided one is definitely overcurrent protection if the one server goes crazy, uh, like a shot. The extreme condition is a short connection, uh, short uh, happening on the motherboard, it, the hot swap controller will cut off the travel power delivery and doesn't affect another server sitting beside it. And also, the hot swap controller can report the system power consumption for that um, server tray. So this way, um, in the data center, we can real-time monitoring every server's power usage in DC level. And mid plane also pro, uh, provide a system fan connection. So all the four system fan is directly connected to the mid plane, and mid plane carries the signal, control signal and tachometer signal to the motherboard. So it's still controlled by the motherboard, but mid plane just provides this uh, passive uh, path connection. 
So another big piece on the next generation is uh, server management. Um, as you know, we kind of removed the BMC. Um, we are reluctant to bring it back. So we, we definitely look into the new uh, technology introduced by these uh, CPU vendors. We found out the Intel uh, DCMI, DCMI stands for Data Center Management Capability Interface, is quite good to be used to meet our needs and we don't need to introduce another dedicated microcontroller and all the components that surround it, like a VR controller, like memory, uh, D, uh, SRAM, flash, all this stuff. So we, we still save the cost, but we can get the features we need um, from the chipset itself. So this in my uh, Intel is putting, uh, the firmware is actually running inside their South Bridge, uh, they call it management engine, and it, uh, DCMI spec is currently available online, is 1.5. Uh, you can download and take a look. Basically, DCMI is a subset of IPMI. So it's a trimmed down version. Uh, it's just for, to meet the data center needs. So we actually uh, work very close with uh, Intel uh, ME team to fine tune this uh, uh, management software, the firmware, which can meet the data center requirement. And later on, we will open these uh, features. Actually, we have been used to the public, so everyone can benefit from that. So I think that will also go through our open compute project. So DCMI can provide the, the remote access and also the local management, but don't need the BMC on board. So here, I also list, list uh, several key features we definitely uh, kind of uh, can leverage from that. Uh, one is serial over LAN. We use a shared NIC, so we don't have a dedicated management pool. We share the one gigabit Ethernet uh, chip, and also a virtual COM port to the host to provide the, the serial, uh, so no extra uh, circuit required. And also remote power control, as I said, power on off, power cycle, and, and doing the system reset. And you can use that through the standard IPMI uh, uh, command because the, actually the remote access protocol is RMCP plus, so it, that's uh, pretty much the same as IPMI. And the last part is the event log. We spend uh, many, uh, a lot of time to fine tune this event log to be able to log every errors uh, into the system so we can retrieve back to do the maintenance or debug, all this stuff, and all those, those uh, sensor uh, like a temperature, fan speed control, all this stuff is, is currently uh, can be achieved by the ME itself, yeah. So all in all, as a summary, uh, for 2012 server deployment, our target is definitely a uh, web tier rack can increase 50% uh, densities per, so per, per column, we increase from 30 to 45. And benefit from higher performance uh, servers and also higher density to share the infrastructure cost. We drive the TCO further down another 30% from today. And also we uh, maintain the higher um, service ability, uh, including the tray hot swappable from the access and all these remote management capability. Yeah, that's, uh, that's all my, yeah, introduced about the our data center. Uh, thank you for the Please. great presentation. A uh, couple of uh, things I want to get uh, some further clarification. One is the mid plane. The mm -hmm. whole board is uh, fully active or it's passive board? It's uh, active because there is a hot swap controller set on site okay. to do the control, but there is no intelligent controller. So basically, we don't run any firmware on the mid plan. Understand. Yeah. Understand. But on the other hand, is uh, <clears throat> uh, what is the failure rate for the mid plane board comparing with the motherboard? So we do the MTBF uh, because the component is minimized. I mean, the only chip there is the hot swap controller. Uh -huh. Other stuff are pretty much all passive. So the, if you count the MTBF, it's basically rely on the, the chip itself, the IC. But because of the component is pretty much mm, too small compared with motherboard, yeah, we, we don't expect that the mid plan will so, have any higher so, failure rate. 
So have you had uh, real data collected to uh, indicate that uh, the uh, failure rate of uh, mid plane uh, is certainly So currently we, don't, uh, uh, we are in the kind of a middle of the development stage. Okay. Uh, we are actually calculate the MTBF for all those uh, PCB bore, including the motherboard and the mid plane, all these PCB bore. Yeah, we will get the, the data. Sure, definitely. thank you. Yeah. Casey Chen from WinTech. Mm -hmm. The memory bus become a higher and higher speed. Yeah. In your next generation servo, mm -hmm. do you using register team for reliability or using unbuffered team for cost okay. of optimization? Okay, so uh, to answer that question, is, uh, depends on the uh, server application, like a type mm -hmm. 126. Type 1 is we are using the unbuffered team mm -hmm. to reach uh, 1600 megahertz, mm -hmm. because in that case, is we more care about memory speed. We mm -hmm. only populate one DIMM per channel. So um, buffer dim is the most economic, economic uh, way for us to get it there. But for the mem cache uh, type two and type six, we require higher memory density, which cannot be achieved by unbuffered dim. So mm -hmm. register dim is used. Using by four or by eight? Uh, it depends on the supply chain, I mean, the cost. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Devan Tripathi from Metalogic. Um, so the two questions, one is that uh, for your type one server, have you thought of using any hardware acceleration for any functions which your application needs? And number two. Sorry, what, I, I, sorry I didn't get it the first Have time. you thought of using any hardware acceleration hardware for, your, acceler for, for your type one server? Hardware accelerators. Accelerators. Oh. Okay, sorry. <laughs> hardware, hardware accelerators. And oh, accelerators. Okay, yeah. okay, got it. And uh, number two, have you made any provision in your design for such an accelerator to be put into your board, if, if that was a requirement? So what kind of a detail, like a hardware accelerator you mentioned, like a Ethernet? Oh. Uh, for your, for type one, where you have a lot of, uh, I believe, search function might be required by your applications, I mean, that kind of accelerator. Mm, currently, uh, as I know, currently there's uh, no such uh, no, no, plan no. yet. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Steve Kaznaki from AMD. Uh, you, you mentioned you have, in your server rack, you have like 91% efficiency uh, VRMs on the motherboard, and, um, and then you're also trying to drive down uh, the, uh, or, or drive up the density in the, your web tier and you know, to get higher and higher densities. My question is, how much of that efficiency of the power supply, will you, will you be willing to trade for uh, rack density if you were to integrate that onto the, let's say, the CPU die or in the package? Power efficiency with, yes, the, yeah. so with, the, with the density with the, of, with the, the, of the density the, of the rack, yeah. So, so currently the density of the rack is actually decided by a couple of factors. Is um, I don't think there is a factor is a power efficiency because we have, uh, if you increase the server count, you if you go over like the 48, the magic number of 48, because a lot of uh, top of rack switch has 48 port, right? Then you have to increase another uh, top of the track, top of rack switch that will increase cost. And also there, uh, we have uh, in data center, each row will have a power limitation. So there is a bus bar. Uh, later on, uh, Pierre will talk about more on the power. So that way we will have uh, uh, each column power limitation. So. In this case, um, if, for, uh, for example, we can put a two server in one chassis, uh, theoretically, in 30 slots, we can actually get 60 servers in one column. But actually, we cannot do that. We only uh, can do 45. So one definitely is a top of our switch, and that is a column power limitation there. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Harry. Uh, it's uh, Josh Han from Intel. In your customer customers, the server design, you are, uh, I assume you are uh, for the type one, two, and the six uh, server, right? Mm -hmm. so, and uh, in this diagram, you are using the 1G Inter, uh, Intel NIC card. Uh, mm -hmm. I can imagine that's because of the uh, network I/O is not a big issue. But uh, what about uh, for the other type of uh, uh, server, such as uh, type uh, type three and four? Uh, are you going to use the 10G instead of okay. 1G? Okay, so for the 10G transition, uh, I think now is actually happening right now.
for the transition, not only considered for the three, four, and five, but also one, two, and six. But now uh, we are um, considering to use uh, add-on power for, the, for that. Okay. Yep. When Amir described the initial first generation server, he made a point to emphasize how useful it is to avoid placing components so that they don't shadow each other in the yeah, air, yeah, uh, yeah, airflow. Yeah. The second generation design appears to have deviated from that approach. Can you briefly comment on the impact of packing the components more densely? Yeah, that's a definitely a good question. It's a disadvantage to make it a, um, kind of a totally shadow. Uh, by moving forward, as you can see, that's a, that's a only most optimized uh, design is based on this uh, Intel architecture. It's actually butterfly the, the memory uh, design. But in the next generation, it's actually going to uh, two sites. So, so we, we already surveyed that, how we can still maintain the spread call, but to find out if we maintain that, we have to dramatically re decrease the dim densities. Mm. So make us kind of a dilemma, like uh, which way we, we go for. So, but for, for this, we also do the um, better air duct design. So we still, yeah, yeah. So we still kind of, uh, not, not as good as uh, totally spread out, right? But it's still quite low. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. Our, our fourth speaker is Perluigi Sarti. He's kind of an old timer at Facebook. It seems he joined in 2009. <laughs> Um, and he's responsible for the, the high efficiency power supply design. And makes quite a difference. Thank you. So let's go, um, what is the, take a look more detailed on the power supply design we did and the power scheme. Uh, it was custom because only doing a custom design we could accomplish the performances we were looking for. This can work. So coming back to what um, Amir mentioned before, this is the uh, standard um, power distribution in a more classical data center, and this is uh, what we did. Now, no question about the, the fact that to get the highest efficiency is uh, to power a service to bring directly the secondary of the transformer, the intermediate uh, voltage transformer, the 480 volt, directly into the server. And the power supply is interconnected directly to the motherboard. This is the best we can do, um, because if we cut everything on the, along the, the path, we just minimize the losses whatsoever. We cannot do, better anything, do anything better than this. Of course, the power supply has to be customized because the 277 uh, voltage is not a standard uh, voltage. Now, here we can see uh, the online power is the 277 going straight to the power supply and the backup power from 48 volt battery carbon that I already showed before, we uh, will take a look at more detail later, is offline power. There is no current flowing here. That's why the efficiency of this UPS equivalent is so high. The current, uh, the flow in the power supply offline is two, three milliamp a 48 volt, so it's milliwatt we don't lose anything. This is going a little bit more deep. This is a, um, I called a modern, meaning a, a pretty recent 
availability, availability component very efficient, like NAC UPS 96% is not common, normally it's 88 to 92. Nowadays you can find 96% and actually is less than 96 because for the redundancy purpose the two UPS are put in parallel, so when they deliver power they work at 50% of the load and the efficiency is gonna be less than 96. But this is the best case. Uh, the transformer also very high efficiency. The PDU, I put 99, normally is less than that. So in a very good traditional scheme, you still get with a 90% power supply an efficiency of 83% to the motherboard. And we have 91.7. The reason is we don't have anything in the middle and we don't lose anything on the UPS because we, all, we only have few milliamp per power supply losses, leakage current DC. And doing the back calculation, taking in consideration the power of one server column, the equivalent efficiency is 99.5%. It's really high. And this is what we save also. That the efficiency discussion is for the OPEX. For the CAPEX, we also save a lot of money because the UPS is a really expensive component, and the PDUs and all the other components. From $2 a watt, we go in the range of 10 cents to 30 cents a watt. Uh, 35 cents a watt is really a big saving on the infrastructure's cost. This is how the power supply is built inside. We have the 277 isolation, 12.5 volt. 40 volt DC, no current here, offline, tied to the output. A little bit more in detail, we have the input stage, the EMI field, the rush control, the power factor correction stage, and the DC-DC, they provide the 12 volt. Then the logic, um, turn on the backup converter when the AC is lost in five milliseconds. This logic can uh, signal to the backup converter within five milliseconds if the AC is lost. And then at this point, the backup converter will turn on together with the main converter that is still on because it can stay on for 20 milliseconds due to the bulk uh, capacitor. They will share during the backup transition, so the dip on the 12.5 volt will be negligible, and then the backup converter takes over. This is a form factor, the sides, two inputs. They will go to two independent power strips that are installed in the rack. Output connector for direct interconnection. These are the main uh, feature of the power supply. So we have uh, efficiency very high. Actually, we pick 95%, but the efficiency over, uh, let's say, 50% to high uh, 80% of the load is about 94.5. It's a very high efficiency. Very low uh, current THD. This is, uh, co causes indirect uh, losses in the distribution in the data center, in the transformers. So uh, this power supply, it's very linear, very clean, does not uh, pollute the input AC current and increase the overall efficiency. Then we have uh, high efficiency converters, both high efficiency 1.5U form factor and uh, one fan that is really running really slow, like a 20, 25% of the speed all the time because the high efficiency of the power supply and because of the 1.5U form factor and it would increase the speed only if the ambient temperature increased above 30 degrees C, and that seldom happens in the data center, so it's very quiet. We could even remove the fan, but we, we can't, of course, we need to be sure that in extreme condition corner cases, the power supply is cooled, and also because during backup operation, where the input current is very high, then we need the, the fan running at full speed. This is a even more in the detail, uh, this is the AC loss. After five milliseconds, the logic realized that, start the transition from main and backup converter. And then when AC comes back, then it stays for one second on steel on battery. And then when the logic decides, okay, now I'm sure the AC is back stable, then uh, the two converters, which again, AC takes cover, and the backup converter shut down. Now, the battery cabinet would not be able to provide uh, backup power for more than 90 seconds anyway. Uh, the genset 
diesel generator is going to kick in, uh, in uh, from 10, let's say from 15 to 30 seconds after the AC outage. So we have extra 60 seconds. And interesting thing here is that if the outage is very fast, like the AC uh, outage lasts three seconds, two seconds, then when uh, it goes to the curve for this uh, two, three seconds, AC comes back and go back to AC pretty much immediately. If the backup is longer than eight seconds, uh, this is six months, we change to eight seconds, then the logic of the power supply understand that at this point, uh, the AC was lost and the, the diesel generator is the one that's gonna provide the power. So when the AC comes back, that means it is from the genset and the genset cannot uh, support full load right away. So we have a scheme for which each power supply will start up a different time randomly. I have a, a, a plot. These are real measured. This AC current is zero because the, um, the service is working out of the battery cabinet during backup. AC now comes back in this point from the genset, the emergency generator. The power supply starts up randomly over a five second period. So the gen set can take the full load in five seconds. And it will not shut down at the very moment we need it. This is a really important feature that we implemented. And again, some uh, data on the power supply uh, feature. This mentioned the gen set startup problems. The uh, very low THD uh, helps to reduce the current in the neutral because uh, normally uh, we think 15, 20% harmonic distortion is good enough, but actually it's enough 5, 6% of distortion that is considered very low to have already a current through the neutral that is 20% uh, of the line current. So if you really want to reduce to zero the harmonic current in the neutral conductor, we will need a THD lower than 2%, theoretically. This is the way it's implemented. We have the DC power strip powering the DC input, the AC power strip powering the AC input. Each one is at 30 sockets. The DC power strip is just a two bus bar with a um, capacitor to the ground and uh, between uh, plus and minus. The AC power strip is more complex, it's still 30 sockets, but we have surge protection included in the power strip. The reason is we don't have the centralized UPS in the data center that would provide a sinusoidal uh, waveform very clean of the 277. So if there's a lighting strike or the transformer, meaning at the input of the UPS, nothing would happen to the input of the power supply, but in this case, we don't have the UPS. So any lighting strike uh, disturbance happening to the intermediate transformer or the power line outside the data center would go straight inside the power supply. So we have some surge protection also in the data center for this reason, plus we have a protection in the power strip and in the front end of the power supply. Hopefully with the three stage, we'll be fine. This is the implementation in the motherboard, direct interconnection here the two voltages. This uh, I think we already seen three times probably. <laughs> and this is the principle of how it works the backup. So we have uh, this battery cabinet is cell power using three rectifiers. We have a photo later. And five battery strings, a 48 volt telecom power. Really reliable and uh, economic. So the... Um, Nominal power rating of the battery cabinet is provided by four strings. The fifth one is for redundancy. So we have our redundancy built in in the battery cabinet. The battery cabinet is offline and provides DC power voltage, sorry, to all the input DC power supply with a few milliamp only. And the main power, the AC to DC power that normally power the servers, come from an independent source that here is only one block, but actually it means all the power supply installed in the servers. The secondary load is the IT switches. So they are powered at 48 volt DC telecom standard, 
directly interconnected to the battery cabinet with the breaker, uh, time delayed breaker. So in case of AC outage, nothing happened to them. They keep uh, taking the 48 volt nominal from the cabinet. Now, floating is 54 volt because there are four uh, battery in series and the floating voltage is 54. As soon as the backup kicks in, the 54 drops to 46, 47 because of the impedance internal resistance of the battery immediately gives this voltage drop because the current is really high, 2000 amp can be, as high as 2000 amp out of this uh, wire here. But the power supply in the DC switches can work from 39 volt, so they will never shut down. This is the, the battery cabinet and the implementation. So 56 kilo or 75, depending on the configuration, depending on which battery we install. Then we have a 648 output. Each one is capable of 175 amp. Six, because we use one battery cabinet for two server rack triplets. Each triplet is a three column, so three, uh, six uh, column and six uh, outputs. The rectifier are very high efficiency, uh, efficiency too, and we like to have high efficiency because um, they are gonna provide power to the battery to keep them charging. Floating charge, even though it's less than 50 watt per string, it's still 250 watt, and they power the switches, which can be as high as 12 total. The worst case, let's say, is a, a three uh, tanking switch, three monitoring switch, and three and three is uh, 12. So, start to be a little bit of power, like 200 watt each would be uh, 2.4 kilowatt, and we want that high efficiency. It's just a, a block diagram and drawing to show the installation switches, offline power, online power. So the three rectifier, the controller actually is only one, it's not two. We, we made everything in one controller. The controllers uh, take care of the algorithm to charge the battery, measure the charging, this charging current, and the impedance of each battery, not of each string, of each battery, as an impedance measurement module. And when we see the impedance of the battery uh, increase above 20, 30%, we have to decide ourselves, ourselves what the limit we want, then it's time to change the battery. We think the battery is gonna last at least five years. It should be seven to 10. This is how it's built inside. It's completely custom cabinet. Normally, the, this kind of cabinet are telecom, so our online system, never offline. This is offline. And this is the complete system. Now, uh, the six output right now, are routed to the column with cable, gauge zero cable, very big. In the future, we may want to do something like this, use a, a bus bar, so the layout will be much more clean in the data center. And the bus bar could also carry the power DC for the switches. This is the, the two power core, they are Again, custom because a connector for 277 was not available. We work on that. Uh, also, I work on that in my past uh, experience, job experience. We, we have now a certified UL 277 connector, but we, uh, it was not available when we started the project in 2009. This is the custom power core with the strain relief for safety because 277 volt and the two power strips. So each trip a 90 rack, uh, 90 servers, sorry. Very easy to service as we discussed so far. We have hot and cold aisle containment. This is the, that you see is the front access so is a uh, cold aisle. And the one that we saw before is the, the first one, 450 watt. We have a new power supply in the same physical form factor and same connector, but it's rated 700 watt. Now, this uh, is um, more efficient. We got efficiency 95% from 35% of the load up to 90% of the load. So in the windmill system that uh, uh, Harry showed, 
the power consumption is always being, it will always be in this range. So we will always work above 95%. This is what we measure. That's a really good result. And uh, plus we add eight signal here. So this SH stands for share, meaning this power supply can share with other power supply of the same kind. And the sharing uh, are um, activated by the way that we connect the signal. So you're gonna be application dependent. For example, for the Nox storage server, we're gonna install two of these. We are gonna show the proper signal and the power supply will become share and is use a droop share technique. So we don't have any connection between the two power supply. It's gonna be natural share. Now that's the reason why 12.5 volt was chosen. First reason is because we are, uh, our backup scheme is a separate converter, separate converter that provides 12 volt to the output. During the transition, you may have a dip. And if we have a nominal 12.5, we have half a volt kind of margin because the motherboard is gonna shut down below 10.8 volt. Another reason uh, I knew, or we knew already, we would use the share droop. So from 12.5 volt and a load, the voltage is gonna go down 12.1, a full load. If you would have chosen 12 volt, it would have gone to 11.6, that was not acceptable. This is the, the windmill motherboard, so the two motherboard and the power supply sits here, empty and with the power supply installed. And that's about it. Now I want to show you a video of the uh, backup. So we had a uh, um, test in our Oregon data center. When uh, that day we pulled the AC to the entire data center to see if the thousands and thousands of servers that were actually going to backup and the system was actually working in the data center environment. Of course, it was very much tested before, but we wanted to see when we have a massive deployment. So this is, uh, now we have the light. The light is gonna go down because it really is shut down. And all the LEDs are green, they start to blink yellow during backup. Now, here the outage. The synchronous blink yellow. When the AC comes back, each power supply start up at a different time because of the random startup scheme. They are still green. Now they're coming back. This is already green. This is already green. But they are coming back spread out. So the gen set now is powering, the real, really, the, the generator is powering now the server. So the generator could take the load nicely from zero watt to five megawatt, actually. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Any question? Um, Uh, thank you for the uh, great presentation. Thanks. I have uh, one question just to try to clarify. When you distribute a 277 volt uh, AC throughout the entire data center, uh, has that been distributed through the uh, shielded bus bar or the uh, unshielded bus bar? We use a bus bar actually to yeah. the distribution in the data center row. Un understand, that's a shielded or unshielded? It is shielded actually. Shielded, okay. Yeah. Uh, so for the future 54 volt, uh, DC bus bar, would that be shielded? No, or, uh, probably not. What, 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 what's the uh, rationale but, uh, behind that? We, uh, only, for, only to clean, to having a clean layout of the power distribution cable at 48 mm -hmm. volt. It's only to make a cleaner layout. It's not a functionality effort Understand. or requirement. So it would be a, a upper rail box. It can even be plastic. I don't think it's gonna be plastic, it's gonna be metallic and then we would run two bus bar inside or maybe cable to save money, but the cable would be confined in a box instead of running around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the only reason. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, Satoshi Matsutenishi. Uh, in the previous talk, the, the, the most, the, the reliability is the lowest in, in the, for the, the data power supply, I heard. Then what, it, what kind of the technique are you 
applied for the second generation for improving the uh, return uh, reliability of the power supply instead of the shared yeah. power supply. We we are gonna uh, add uh, we are gonna we are thinking we are designing redundant power. So we'll have shelf. If one power supply fail, nothing would happen, and then the technician will come to repair that. And for the backup, because you, you are correct, when you go into backup, there is another converter that is powering the server at this point, and we will make that redundant as well. So we will have the redundancy cover us for the failure. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Pierre Luigi. Was, uh, it's sort of a detailed question, but I, I was wondering why the um, s specification point was 450 watts for that power supply, because it, it seems to me like a 2U NALM or a Westmere server would be more like 150 to 200 watts yeah, operating. Yeah, correct. <laughs> so do you use it for the JBODs or something? And that's why you need, do you just have one power supply you use for everything? We had, we had, we had to decide the power rating. At the time, we were not sure. If you uh -huh. do all the calculation with Excel spreadsheet, it would come into 700 watts. And this is impossible. It's not going to be like that in the real application, real software. Okay. So at the end, uh, we figured that probably our motherboard would not and be more than 300 watt. Mm. We decided for 450, thinking about also possible share solution, because the 700 share is also available now at 450 share. So at that point, we would have 900 watt. So we decide 450, and then we decide 700. But you are correct, we don't, we don't need more than probably 270 watt right now. Mm. So the windmill system with two motherboard and the 700 power supply, mm. let's forget about the 700 is 0.5% more efficient, but the efficiency will be much higher because it's going to work all the time, 95%. Yeah. Right now, probably we are, no, we are working at 93.5. Yeah. Okay, so you're still pretty efficient, though, even at oh, 30%. Yeah. Or also, the distribution loss in data center is very low because 277 is higher than 208. Mm -hmm. right. And using the same copper, you gain. So I think we are losing less than 0.4, in distribution losses okay. from the intermediate voltage transformer that we pay the 480 volts, so whatever we lose after the 480 is, is on us. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, no, thank you for all these uh, great things. Uh, we just wondered if uh, uh, Facebook would be open for uh, uh, projects like uh, building co-location center for other people following Facebook's uh, data center design. Well, we probably wouldn't build, but the, the specification is open to be used to build anything equal to what we have, yes. Oh, okay. So, well, sure, sure. And then collaboration also. We have ideas we publish in the OCP website, and uh, somebody comes and uh, have a suggestion to make it better, and then uh, it's a collaboration effort, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And that last question was actually rather appropriate for our, our final speaker, David Ricordon, um, who is sort of putting the open in open compute. Um, he's another old timer at, at Facebook, has been there two years, um, and he had an un sort of unusual path. He went from a criminal justice dropout to open source software standards to something completely different, open source hardware standards. David. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, if there's one thing that's not quite like the others here today, it's probably me. Um, but I've, I mean, I mean, I think I really need to give it to like Amir's team for giving me the like, um, I don't know if I'd say deep dive, but uh, the crash course on hardware over the past year and a half, where, so I joined Facebook about two years ago. Uh, I'm a software guy, have been building out an engineering team around open source and standards. How do we help engineers inside of the company use open source, release open source? And then this hardware team comes to us, like a year and a half ago, and they're like, we want to open source hardware. Like, okay, that's interesting. What do you mean? They're like, well, we don't really know. We we're hoping you could tell us. Like, okay, I guess we'll go learn about hardware. Um, and it really was about a year's worth of effort going into that initial conversation of, we want to go and release our custom server designs, our data center designs, as whatever it means for open source hardware, into actually going and doing it. So 
Today, I also realize I stand between all of you sitting here and wine and cheese and all of those amazing things, so I'll be brief. But I want to give you a little bit of background on how do we think about open source at Facebook? What are a few of the areas that we use open source software? And then from the philo philosophical side, why do we go and release key pieces of our infrastructure as open source, both for software and for hardware? To do that, I first want to set a little bit of context. We, Facebook is big, but what does that actually mean? Um, so over 750 million people using the site every single month, 700 billion minutes spent on the site every single month, 30 billion pieces of content shared every single month, and then Facebook also having aspects of our platform on millions of sites across the web, whether those are those li uh, the like buttons that you see, comments boxes, or people going and directly building with our API to add social functionality to what they're doing. So normally we talk about software infrastructure, but what's been fun over this past year is really being able to go talk about this hardware layer that sits below all of our software as well. And how do these different things work together? So if we look at our growth from 2004 to beginning of this year, about 2011, this is looking at active user growth. And we've been rolling out products as well at an increasing rate. So these are a lot of our key product launches over the past few years, and you'll notice right now, yeah, that past year, we just like kept rolling out product after product after product after product. Last summer we were launching something like every single week. Um, it was a lot of fun. And so through this, if we look at that period of time from 2008 to the beginning of 2011, we've more than 10 x our active user, uh, a number of people that have active users on Facebook, which has put tremendous strains on our infrastructure as well. So I want to give you a little bit of an example from the software side before I move into talking about philosophy and then how we've applied that hardware. But around this time in 2008, it was really clear that if we kept building the site as we were doing at that time, it, we wouldn't be able to keep up with the growth. The front end of the site is basically all PHP. It's a scripting language. We love it from the side that it's quick. It's easy to iterate. We can teach any engineer PHP. Um, but it also is not the most efficient language in the world. So there were three projects that were started simultaneously. A little bit of competition, but healthy competition between these engineers to try to solve this. So the first was PHP server. Um, it was relatively low risk. It had the potential of a much lower reward was going and trying to optimize some of those common things that you could do. The second was uh, Quirkus, which was going and re-implementing the PHP runtime in Java uh, based on a project that had already been started, sort of medium risk, medium reward coming out of it. And then a third was super high risk, super high reward. If it, we managed to pull it off, it was completely unknown. This was started at a hackathon of, hey, PHP source code, could we programmatically transform it into C++, then produce a compiled binary, push this binary out to all of our web servers, and run that in production? So throughout this, well, killed Ben's first, killed Steve's next, and, we, and Hyping was actually really successful. So this is the web server that we use in production today. It's 4.2 times faster than standard PHP, saves us tens of millions of dollars annually, by going through this crazy process of like PHP source code, which developers write, programmatically transform it in C++, produce a compiled binary that's well over a gigabyte in size, distribute it with BitTorrent to tens of thousands of servers of open compute machines, and run that. Uh, so a little crazy, but you'll see that idea throughout a lot of our different projects. What would happen if we tried something different? So that was hip hop. We went and open sourced that a little over a year ago. And since then, we've seen a community form around it. We've seen even some of our competitors go and contribute patches back to it that make it even faster, make it even better, because they are getting value out of it, too. They're able to go and take what we've created, which we don't see as core to our business, which we don't see as competitive, and run their sites, make their sites even faster, and then go and contribute back to that as well for the entire community. So another example is when we go and look at data infrastructure. So this is roughly looking at how much data are we going and uh, storing and processing per day. So this is not user data. This is more like logs and things like that. Gone from about 1.2 terabytes a day in 2008 to well over 100 terabytes a day uh, today. 
What's interesting is like the past six to nine months, we've actually been focused on, or one of our focuses has been on reducing the amount of data that we're logging uh, because we're like 100 terabytes a day times lots of days, times like lots of Knox machines, not a good thing uh, necessarily in terms of having that continue growing. But huge growth from that side. So we could have built all of this infrastructure ourselves, but there was a lot of open source that we could rely on and then other pieces that we went and added. So this is looking at our data infrastructure. Uh, the boxes at the top are what are deployed alongside each of our web stacks. So we have a bunch of web servers. They use Scribe to go and consolidate logs into a Hadoop cluster, and that's like times N across all of our different uh, web tiers. Those get synced down into our Platinum Hadoop cluster, and that's the one where like, if it goes down, we lose money, it's bad. So like, we care a lot about uh, the quality of the queries that are run against it. Uh, syncing data with our MySQL cluster, which is where we store the majority of our user data, um, and then off to our Silver cluster for like ad hoc jobs. So this is another example where we didn't have to build all of this. Because we were able to take advantage of Apache Hadoop, which Yahoo had originally released, and then we wrote Scribe and contributed that back, we've been able to like, dramatically decrease the number of people that had to go into building out this infrastructure that's able to process hundreds of terabytes worth of data every single day. And I think that's an important piece when we go and look at how do we build our infrastructure, why do we release pieces of infrastructure that we develop, is how do we go and share investment across the industry for areas that really aren't core to our business. So why do we do these things? Boiling that back up into a few uh, higher level bullet points. Well, the first is we care a lot about enabling that next generation of startups. We have a very robust platform. Lots of companies are going and building on top of it. If they're able to go and take advantage of how we process data, how we uh, serve web pages, um, how we write uh, uh, PHP in a way that helps avoid cross-site scripting, they can then go focus on building their core product. Um, I think the same thing goes for hardware as well. Maybe the word isn't necessarily startup in there, um, but hopefully we get to that point where this hardware that we've created is able to go and enable the next generation of companies to build on top of it, to go and move innovation to a different part of the stack. And that's something that's important to us. Facebook would not exist in the way that it does today. It would not have been created out of a Harvard dorm room if there wasn't Linux, if there wasn't Apache, if there wasn't MySQL, if there wasn't PHP. And that's something that's important to us. Obviously, recruiting the best engineers, um, being able to go and show exactly, here's how we solved a hard problem, these are the hard problems that we have, being able for the team here to go and talk about, this is how I did something, you, all of you to be able to interact with them, I think plays a big part in terms of how we're able to go and hire really the top engineers throughout the world, whether that's once again on software or on the hardware side of the company. Showing the hard problems, it goes into that. A lot of people think of us as like, it's this little PHP website, like it has some buttons and things, but like, holy shit, there's a lot that goes into making that work. So we can show that directly instead of just like, don't take my word for it. Like go look at some of these pieces of infrastructure. And then that idea of sharing investment across the industry. I think this is one that really resonates with the Open Compute Project, where if we go and look at what a small team of people at Facebook were able to do, what happens if we're able to go and take advantage of 100 people around the world contributing to that? What happens if, we're not, if we have a piece of the problem and we solve that, but then, you know what, there's actually another piece of the problem that we may not be focused on today, but matters to us a year from now. How do we go and really share that innovation, share that cost of innovation in something that isn't core to what we do from a business perspective, but it's certainly core to our ability to operate and our ability to scale? So what are some of the differences with hardware around, the, uh, around releasing it compared to software? Um, I think one of the largest questions we had was like, how do we do this? With open source software, there's like clear licenses. It's like you've got the GPL, you've got the Apache license. People understand what open source software means. They understand here's how I go and use it. Um, and that really wasn't necessarily clear from a hardware perspective. So rather we went back to our goals. Well, 
we want to allow other people to contribute to this. We want to allow other people to go and use this without having to pay us uh, for any royalties or anything like that. We want to uh, freely available intellectual property throughout that. So we went and relied on a license that's becoming a little bit more popular in the uh, software standards space, uh, around uh, web standards especially, for going and releasing the hardware. But that was a piece of it. Another challenge I think that we encountered was um, how do we involve our partners? This was something where obviously like we did a lot of the design, we did a lot of the testing, but not all of it. Um, and so going and having those conversations with our partners that were involved in this project, trying to get them also to understand why would you want to do this, how will this go back and benefit them, um, was another challenge that the team uh, worked through. And then I think today we get to this point where it's like, okay, we've released these specifications, we've released these CAD files, but how do people actually contribute? What does it mean to send us a patch to our motherboard specification. How do you test it? Like if I'm dealing with software, if I'm dealing with Hadoop, it's like, well, we have some unit tests, and here's the input, here's the output. It compiles on your machine, it compiles on my machine. Um, it's not quite the same with hardware, unless these guys have been lying to me this entire time, but I don't think so. So like, how do you go and support a, a growing community with like, proto like prototype motherboards? How do you go and like pool together so, some of those resources that it might take to say, hey, we want a second ethernet port on this motherboard? How do you go and test it? How do you go and, to someone's question before, um, yeah, we're not gonna go host other people's software in our data centers, but how do we go and make this technology more readily available so that you can go and buy it if you want and so that you don't need to buy it with the minimum quantities that we have from our suppliers directly? How do, and I think those are the harder questions today. How do we develop this ecosystem? How do we make it really collaborative? How do we make it something that benefits all of the different companies that are involved? And then ultimately, uh, entrepreneurs all around the world. I think we're starting to get some of those answers, but back to that original uh, question when the, when the team came to us a year and a half ago of what does it mean to go and open source this hardware? We're still figuring that out and obviously iterating. One of the pieces that we have coming up is a summit in New York, I think end of October, I think Mir said like the 27th, um, where we're trying to pull together more people to, to determine answers to some of these questions, to go and find some other projects of, hey, we've started uh, an AMD motherboard, an Intel motherboard, these power supplies, our chassis, storage project. What are other projects that people want to do? and being able to go and embrace them. So this isn't something that's only like, take Facebook technology, release Facebook technology, but it's really something that's driven by a community. So if you're in our offices, it's only a few blocks away. Um, you, if you live around here, you should come by for lunch or something at some point. Amir will host you. Um, <laughs> sweet, a little bit of a laugh. Well, you see these signs. This day is 1% finished. Map is 1% finished. And really what we mean through, with these is expressing our value on iteration. Done is better than perfect. We are going and transforming industries to make them rethink what would it be like to be social from the ground up. You have these games where now they really are social from the start. And so we apply this not just to product, not just to our platform, but really to everything that we do. So I, think, I don't think anyone would argue with me that what we're doing around hardware, what we're doing around how do we build this community, is going to be iterative, and we're only just beginning. Second thing that you'll see is this sign, what would you do if you weren't afraid? It might sound crazy, whether it's like hip hop, of like, hey, let's go programmatically turn our PHP into C++, produce binary, distribute it with BitTorrent, run it in production, like, um, but we, we tried it. We'd, uh, we'd much rather go and take a risk, learn something from it and fail, than not try in the first place. And I think that's something that's also really been embodied by the hardware team here and in the Open Compute Project. And what, one of the pieces that got us past that point a year and a half ago of saying, well, what, like, there is risk here. Why, like, why should we take it on? Because we want to go and see what happens if we're actually able to go and build a real collaborative pro uh, project around hardware 
at a really large scale. So you can find out a bit more about um, our open source projects, facebook.com slash open source. Um, have a little bit of time for questions as well. I hope that my uh, one of these is not quite like the others, uh, didn't, uh, was not too jarring, um, and you're still awake. Um, or we can go get wine and cheese, and you can ask us all questions there. It's really up to all of you. Um, but I definitely want to thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about something that's a little bit different uh, as part of this tutorial and explain, explain some of our philosophy and some of our reasoning behind why we go and release core pieces of our infrastructure, whether that's software or hardware, as open source to further develop inside of a community. Thanks.